when it came exam time, and that's another trip in and of itself. Listen, we had uh, exams. They would take you to this special room in a special building that you had never been to before called the Red Room. Hmm. And you would pile up like, like sheeple, like cattle, outside of the Red Room, right? And you got, you got a, a hundred and something students all together about to take a big exam. And, you know, if you don't pass this exam, you don't get to move on, right? Yeah, and, and there's a good chance you could get kicked out of school, right? So everybody's super stressed. I mean, the energy in that room was so negative and so full of fear and toxic. It was uh, unbelievable. And, you know, I just took it as normal. Okay, we just stay in here. Uh, and then all of a sudden after about, and you would stay in there, for, they would have you there for about a good 30 minutes. And then they would let you into the exam room. Then you would take the exam after you had this congestion of energy. And I, you know, it wasn't until I started looking at, you know, mind control and manipulation of some of these videos and stuff that you put up. But I said, man, that was a mind control thing. And greetings. Welcome to LennonHonor.com. My name is Lennon Honor, and I greet you all with lots of love, peace, and positivity. And I'm saying positivity here on April 19th, 2013, because many of you know there has been a lot of negativity circulating on the news. Uh, and I just want to say this before we even get into the show, that wherever you may be at on the planet, understand that love is at your doorstep, that peace is in your mind. And you can claim it at any given time, regardless of the media manipulation and the fear mongering all over the world right now, that you can find peace in your life at any given time. My name is Lennon Honor and welcome to LennonHonor.com. We have a, a very important and I'm going to say a groundbreaking radio interview uh, here on LennonHonor.com. And we're going to be doing a series of radio shows uh, with uh, Dr. Alvin Mahoney, a.k.a. Dr. Z., and this series of radio shows, we have a title for it, and it is titled Trauma-Based Mind Control, The Making of Medical Doctors. Fascinating. Fascinating. We're going to be taking uh, the next few months uh, to talk about particular issues. And Dr. Z, he's, he's courageous enough and honorable enough to share his story. And uh, there are some things I'm sure that he's going to share that is going to put a lot into perspective as to why. Uh, the medical establishment is as it is, but then to also provide us with some levels of hope, too, because there are doctors out there who understand what's taking place and have turned things around, at least in their own practice and are seeking to help other doctors to do the same. Fascinating. Wonderful. See, no need to be fearful of everything because there are people out there who are trying to lift the veil of fear and empower people in the process. Dr. Z is such an individual, and I'm so thankful that he agreed uh, to do this radio interview. Dr. Alvin Mahoney, a.k.a. Dr. Z, is a medical doctor who is currently working in private practice as a neuropsychiatrist and naturopath, focusing on techniques and strategies to obtain optimum health both mentally and physically. Dr. Z is writing a book titled Complicated World. In this book, Dr. Z shares his journey to becoming a master of the healing arts, Throughout his journey, Dr. Z has been faced with many challenges, including a medical system that traumatizes, manipulates, and brainwashes medical students. As Dr. Z will explain, trauma-based mind control is the methodology through which medical doctors are made. In this series of radio interviews with Dr. Z, he will share with us how he overcame the challenges he faced and how he has become a caring and compassionate medical doctor. Dr. Z will also share with us some of his personal experiences with the medical establishment use of trauma-based mind control and how doctors are set up for manipulation, mind control, and ultimately brainwashing. Dr. Z's book, Complicated World, also addresses the five elements of healing and consciousness awakening. Dr. Z is currently involved in setting up a multidisciplinary healing institute called Total Life Center. Dr. Z can be reached via email at totallifecentertlc at gmail.com total life center tlc at gmail.com well ladies and gentlemen i am so honored and so thankful and so grateful uh, to have uh, dr z uh, here as a radio interview guest i want to invite dr z to the show welcome dr z uh, hello, Lennon, and uh, thank you very much for that gracious introduction. It's um, a pleasure to be here, and I want to wish uh, the, the listening audience peace, power, prosperity, and most of all, love to everyone out there and their families as well. Uh, certainly, you know, the thing we were talking about right before we came on about fear being the mind killer, and uh, 
certainly is something we have to be aware of every day in our lives, that that fear creeps in, it sneaks in, it comes in from various ways, and since the program is inside of us, we've got to be aware of it and, and, and just be uh, pay attention to it and not let it take over. So that's, that's part, of, part of the key. I mean, it's funny that um, uh, uh, how we met, I uh, actually sought you out. Uh, I was already a premium subscriber, already had watched many, many videos by you, had already purchased the book in, Into the Garden of Consciousness. Uh, so I was uh, a supporter, and uh, I listened to all of the, um, uh, the people that came on about health and healing, uh, which I think they were right on. Um, uh, actually, one of my mentors is Dr. Uh, Robert Morse, who's uh, out in Sarasota. Uh, who's a naturopath and uh, right now uh, undergoing another uh, naturopathic training through his, uh, his his training program. So that's uh, that's wonderful that you had him on already. And uh, Dan McDonald, you had on the Life Regenerator. I've already spoken to him and talked to him about some things that I thought he needed to uh, uh, plug in the holes in some of the things that he was doing, which he's now doing. So that's good. And uh, pretty much um, most of the people you've had on have been on the right path except there was no uh, medical doctor who had been trained scientifically uh, to understand why the things that all these people were mentioning actually work. And so I called them up and the first conversation, I think I ran my mouth for 62 minutes. And I think the only thing Lennon said during that time was, I know that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's right. <laughs> I know that's right. And uh, after 62 minutes, he goes, we got to have you on the show. We're going to have you on not once, not twice, but three times. So this is the first, hopefully, of, uh, of a, a three-part series. Um, and, and today we'll focus mostly on what, how doctors are trained, how they're made, uh, what the, uh, uh, how they're traumatized and ultimately my own personal experiences and, and, and how I came out of it and uh, even some of the effects, the lingering effects of today because I, I, uh, once you go through that system, uh, which is very much like the military, it's like fighting in a war uh, uh, and you develop, I mean, the, the, the medical training equals post-traumatic stress disorder and there's no, no uh, way around that. Uh, some of us are aware of that. Uh, most of the people that I trained with that were in my inner circle, we all were aware of that. And by the time I had done uh, four, uh, completed my four years at uh, Howard University, and actually eight years because I did four years of undergrad there and four years of medical school there, and of course then uh, four years of neuropsychiatry at USC, which t takes me out to Southern California where I am today practicing, uh, uh, my inner circle of friends, that we all knew that it was traumatic. And uh, at that point, uh, coming from uh, finishing up internship, which was quite nightmarish to say the least, uh, that's when I decided to assign myself a new name. The name is, has no meaning. The, the name is Zael, Z-A-I-E-L. And I just said, I'm just going to call myself Zael M.D. And they said, what about your last name? I said, there's no last name. It's just Zael M.D. And, uh, uh, for, you know, for the, for, for the listener, it's much easier just to, just to refer to me as Dr. Z. But that was uh, actually just sort of a um, another uh, you know, sort of a symbolic pending change of consciousness. And so with the change of consciousness came a change in the name. So that's that, that, that's where we are today. So, Lennon, where would you like to start? Well, I'd like to start just why don't we just talk a little bit about what you're doing now um, and what the, the practice that you're involved with now. And then we can start to go back and look at uh, why you decided to uh, pursue this particular career and then the introduction and the experience that you had. All right. Let's, let, let's start off with some real general philosophies about healing that I have. Uh, that uh, uh, is probably won't be the first time your audience because they're bright and they they they, they listen to the to, to the other uh, 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 radio guests. I, you know, it became very uh, clear to me when we talk about male female uh, relationships, uh, positive male female relationships, uh, negative polarity, positive polarity, and then ultimately we talk about mother nature and we talk about light. And, uh, you know, it occurred to me uh, early on, um, uh, this was obviously after medical school uh, and um, my neuropsychiatric training, um, I started to ask the questions as to why people are getting sick, why cancer is, that, uh, is the number one cause of disease now in America, but yet we're supposed to have the most advanced medical system in the world, uh, why heart disease is uh, 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 number two. 
uh, and the answers that I was getting were very few within that within that system. So the system in itself did not provide the full Monty, the full answers that I that I needed in order to really help people at the deepest levels. All right? The first thing I said is all healing, all healing begins and ends with light. And the reason I say light, and right now we're talking about uh, cosmic light from the sun. All right, because without that cosmic light from the sun, nothing gets done. Uh, there is no creation. There is no planet. There is no warmth. There is no anything growing. There's nothing developing. But that 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 light has to hit a receptive vehicle. Uh, that receptive vehicle being uh, Mother Earth and Mother Nature, and I'll just refer to her as Mother Nature right now. And she is has the female qualities. Yes, it's the receptive qualities. And there is this intercourse, so you call it sexual intercourse if you'd like to uh, make it uh, the story sound better, but it really is a, a sexual intercourse. It's the same type of sexual intercourse that humans have to produce other humans and their babies. The father, son, and mother nature have an intercourse. Mother nature's womb is that fertile soil. Uh, her seed or her egg is the thing that, go, that gets stimulated by the light or penetrated by the light. All right, and that's why we talk about the intercourse, so that, that sun energy, that vibration, hits Mother Nature's womb and her seed, and we, we, we call it, in, in science world, we call it photosynthesis. And it creates little light beings. These little light beings being fruits, vegetables, herbs, mushrooms. And this is primarily what we should be taking into our body and as close to us that, that state is possible. Um, uh, and given what the standard American diet is today, and, you know, that stands for SAD, SAD, and, of course, that's been mentioned before, and it is a SAD diet. Uh, it's way too, way, way too much processed foods, way too much um, um, protein, way too high in protein, uh, way too high in fat. Uh, uh, fast foods, you know, I mean, this is ridiculous. Uh, uh, you can't get healthy eating this stuff. And yet, I go into a hospital and I go to the administrators and I say, hey, listen, we need to change the dietary prescriptions that these patients are getting because we can't feed them junk. All right, we I feed them the standard American diet and expect them to get better. Uh, so I try, and, 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 and so what I came up with, I said, hey, these are the four elements that we really need to address on a consistent basis. The first one is oxygenation, and I'm not going to get into deep into that uh, uh, today. We might have time at the end of the show. I'll get into it a little bit deeper. But oxygenation, one of the most important things. Alkalinization of the body, obviously extremely important. Nutrification, which is not a real word, but I think you guys understand the body needs to have the proper nutrition that it can absorb. Of course, water is uh, a, a nutrient. So it is a clean water, and I've just done an extensive, probably three to four month uh, research, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll be posting a YouTube video on my uh, findings about water, what the best water is, um, how to get the best water, uh, how to purify your water. I mean, and, I'm so, and, and, and I'll do it from a scientific point of view. Uh, the, uh, and the last one, and maybe the most important one, is detoxification. Because if you're doing the other three, your body's automatically going to start to uh, rid itself of toxins. Um, I know when I did my first serious uh, detox, uh, I ended up getting a basal cell carcinoma on my foot. Um, uh, uh, I wasn't afraid because uh, I knew why it was there. It was there because I started an intensive cleaning program. And instead of allowing my feet to breathe, I was covered in shoes and socks, and I was working, you know, seven days a week, six to eight hours, and now allowing my feet to breathe. Well, your feet happen to be one of the areas where a lot of toxins come out. Mm. Uh, and so if you're in an intensive detox program, you want to take good care of your feet. You want them exposed to sunlight. You want them to be able to breathe. I've since learned that and probably now invested probably three or $400 on, on flip-flops. That's mm. primarily what I wear. <laughs> mm -hmm. I work, but I, I guarantee you they wait in the car as soon as I get out of that work, the flip flops go on because I need my feet to breathe. All right, when I go outside I, uh, in my backyard, uh, um, it's nothing but the sun hitting, hitting bare feet, and that's it. I let them breathe. Um, uh, another thing that people uh, don't pay attention to is their dental health. So you got to pay, pay attention to your feet. You have to pay attention to your mouth. Uh, these two things get neglected too easily, and they can cause problems. Of course, when I just uh, I looked at the basal cell carcinoma, and I said, okay, let me go 
cut a leaf of aloe vera plant. Let's go get some essential oils, mainly peppermint, sage, and um, eucalyptus is what I use. And I just uh, 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 gave my feet a chance to breathe, uh, 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 put, put the uh, essential oils on, mix the um, aloe vera. And this is, uh, listen, this is, the, uh, this is not anything that's processed. You get the leaf, you cut the leaf open, you grab it, it's sloppy, it's snotty, and you rub it onto your feet, rub it onto your face, rub it wherever you need to, to rub it. It's a great moisturizer, I'm a big believer in aloe vera. And I just used that in about three weeks. I was able to just peel the cancer off just like it was a scab. Mm. So, uh, 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 but again, nothing, it was nothing to get afraid of because I understood not, no, had you gone to a medical doctor, they, they've been cutting it, burning it, and maybe even uh, opening up blood entryways where now cancer cells get into your bloodstream and they spread the damn thing all over the place, right? Because I always want to cut, burn, and do something with it. Where all you have to do was understand, hey, it's a toxic reaction, let it Continue what you're doing, but let your feet breathe. And and uh, it took me about maybe three weeks, and I was uh, just able to peel the whole thing right off. But but I knew that's what the way it was going to go. I knew what it was. I knew why it was there, and I and I understood the whole the physiology behind it. And so I never was afraid. Now, see if if the doctors tell you, uh, well, you know, you have cancer. Well, that automatically there's the fear, right? Mm-hmm. And so now that creates a whole physiological cascade, right? That now puts you behind the uh, uh, eight ball. So, so to speak, and also makes it more likely that that cancer will take root. All right. So the first thing again uh, 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 is about fear. All right. So that's why, you know, I, I gave you four: uh, the oxygenation, the alkalinization, the nutrification, the detoxification. And the fifth element, and this is the most important element. And, and listen, I'm a Hollywood buff. Um, I like movies. Uh, you'll see me make uh, plenty of. Uh, uh, references to a couple of movies. My, my, the one I make the most references to with my patients is The Matrix. <laughs> and what's we'll about that as to why that is uh, l- later on. And uh, uh, there was a, a movie called The Fifth Element. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in that movie, uh, Bruce Willis and I'm, uh, Mia Jojovich were, I think, the co stars of that one. Uh, it wasn't a great movie. It was uh, okay. It was uh, uh, well done in terms of special effects and everything. But, but the message, see, the, the, the message was. Uh, that uh, she came here to activate a, a weapon that would protect Earth, but she could not activate that weapon unless something inside of her was activated first. And the thing that needed to be activated was love. And so it was a great message about love, heart chakra opening. All right? uh, her uh, and Bruce Willis was that uh, uh, the, the male force that allowed that love energy to percolate and ultimately for her to uh, uh, be able to sacrifice uh, open up and, and activate that, that weapon. So the fifth element is always your mind or your consciousness. Uh, uh, most of the people that come to me sick right now, uh, you know, I can teach them the four elements all day long and how to get deep into those four elements. And uh, uh, we can talk about vegetarianism, raw foodism. My, I myself right now is about 90% raw food. Uh, but you don't have to go that deep to be healthy. You can, you, you, you can do less. But most of your diet, the majority certainly should should consist of uh, 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 fruits and vegetables because these little light beings that, that, that carry the frequency of healing uh, the mother nature makes on a daily basis are what we need. The problem now is man in his ignorant state has gone along and started genetically modifying things. Mm-hmm. So now we can't eat soy because, well, soy is bad anyway. Uh, uh, the phytates in soy uh, absorb minerals and take her out of your system. Uh, the Japanese uh, 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 who were who brought soy to the forefront would only eat soy if it was fermented soy, the miso, the tempeh, et cetera, and even then just a little bit. And if it's fermented, it's not as bad, but again, I would not uh, recommend anybody, especially anybody who's sick, to, to get soy because the phytates take out the minerals. And this is where we're all the fishermen, uh, most of us anyway, that are not eating the queen's diet, that continue to eat the king's diet, heavy in meats, heavy in, in processed foods, uh, uh, heavy in uh, processed carbohydrates. And uh, uh, it's no wonder why, you know, uh, we're sick in America. Uh, we, uh, we, I have an example. Um, I was talking to a group of doctors the other day. Um, and I said, I said, none of you guys are real doctors. You don't know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> Uh, just just them a little bit, just to get conversations started. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not any ego trip or anything like that. I mean, some of these guys are quite talented in what they do, but they do only one thing specifically, and it's, and you create tunnel vision. And so uh, uh, I said, okay, 
let, let's take something simple, right? Give me the three leading uh, causes of heart disease. And so they say, well, you know, cholesterol. I said, when did cholesterol? Somebody show me now. Get on the internet. This is the, this is the age of the internet where we can just look up something. Show me where cholesterol causes heart disease. I said, you will not find a study. Uh, the the uh, uh, the Farmingham study back in the 70s that implicated uh, cholesterol as a causative of heart disease has been debunked. It is a myth. What is happening is because our diets are acid forming, right? And this acid creates inflammation. And, uh, and as far as chronic disease is concerned, all uh, uh, all these chronic diseases have at its core acidosis and inflammation, right? When an inflammation occurs, okay, and primarily the three leading causes of heart disease now, if you do the research and then you apply your scientific knowledge to it, is chlorine, milk, and trans fatty acids, especially cooked trans fatty acids is the worst. Uh, that you can do, and then people sit, sit around and take the trans fatty acids, they cook the meats in it, and then the next day they come and microwave it. All right. And I hope my mother's listening because she still uses a microwave. I come back to New York and I get uh, microwave water. I said, "You are you actually heating up water in a microwave to make some herbal tea? That's insanity. You need to throw that thing out." So hopefully she's throwing it out by now. But uh, yeah, please get rid of your microwave and never use the thing. If you need to cook food fast, use a convection oven. It's the same price and much much healthier. So uh, that's that, that's how it all started. But um, I, so so none of them knew that, that what the three leading causes of heart disease were. I said cholesterol is a band aid. I said if you cut yourself and you put a band aid on the, on the wound to help to, to help protect it. Are you going to tell me that the Band-Aid is the cause of the cut, which is essentially what modern medicine is trying to tell us? Well, that's ass backwards. Excuse the French. It is a Band-Aid. The Band-Aid is not the problem. As a matter of fact, is when that Band-Aid goes on, and it's a protective Band-Aid. It is, the body is trying to protect itself, uh, and that Band-Aid will come off naturally if you don't continue to insult the body. Well, of course, on the King's diet, the standard American diet, the fat diet, we continue to insult the body, and then we have the fear-based mind control, which may, uh, attracted me to uh, uh, Mr. Honor in the first place because I knew that fear was the mind killer, mm. and fear s sets up, and that's why the fifth element is your mind, Fear sets up a negative cascade, a, a, a another source of, of, of toxin. Mm. So the, your own mind toxify, uh, 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 toxifies your body. So part of your detoxification program all, always has to be with uh, mental first. Uh, mental, spiritual, however you want to say it, conscious awakening, uh, realizing who and what you are, you know, uh, going back to the basics. If you come to me as a patient, I always tell you, I said, do you even know who you are? I said, you don't know who you are. And this is where I go back to the matrix. I said, you know what? I, are we going, uh, do you want the red pill or the blue pill? Because either you want to wake up or you don't want to wake up. I can offer you the truth, and that's it. Uh, I can teach you, and, uh, and, then, and then you have to do the work. You have to take responsibility. I'm not your healer. I'm not even your doctor anymore. I am the guy who is going to guide you until you got enough information to take over and do it yourself. All right. And some of that takes experimentation. Some of it takes a lot. A lot, a lot. It takes effort. And most people would rather have things spoon fed to them. And I, you know, I don't do that to my patients anymore. I say, go do the research. You know, they ask me about, you know, what am I, what am I eating and so forth and so on. What's a, what's a good detox, uh, 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 recipe. I said, why don't you go figure it out for yourself? I'll give you what I did. I can tell you what I ate today, but, uh, that's what, that's what works for me. And everybody's got to figure out what works for themselves. Uh, uh, but I will tell you, if you're not eating, you know, 80 to 90 percent of what the nature's little light creatures, those fruits and vegetables and herbs, you're going to have problems, right? And, and I've looked at both sides of it. I've read the book, The, the Vegetarian Myth and all that kind of stuff, and, and that's complete nonsense. Uh, listen, I've used it on myself. I know it works. I know it doesn't work. Uh, and I know I know the science as to why it doesn't work. So that's where we are. But the fifth element is always your mind, your consciousness, your awakening, and your self-identity. 
uh, uh, and you stated it so nicely in your, in your book, um, Deep into the Garden of Consciousness, we are suffering from a, a crisis in identity. Yeah, we don't know who we are. Mm. Now, I'm sure most of your listening audience is starting to wake up to who they are and what they are, but we are massively powerful beings or massively creative beings, and when that creativity is unlocked, you know, you uh, uh, you then unlock what your spiritual mission is. You then unlock your passion. And everybody asks me, well, what's the key to happiness? You're a neuropsychiatrist. You've been practicing for 30 years. What, what, what's the key to happiness? I said, the key to happiness is either you have a dream, you pursue that dream with all your passion, you don't take no for an answer, and if you have to fail your way to the success, you fail your way to the success. I said, when you were walking as a child or learning how to walk as a child, you fell hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of times, but you never gave up, you never quit, and eventually you learned to walk. Mm. Uh, that's already programmed into your head. So, you know, but we're so afraid now of failure or no, or, uh, or you know, uh, uh, everybody's so sensitive. We got, uh, uh, we got we're, we're living in fear, uh, race-based thinking, geographical-based thinking, uh, 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 socio-economical thinking that is completely insane. Keeps us separated. Keeps us, uh, at the very least, not communicating to everybody. And in order to be successful in life, uh, no one person can do it by, by himself. You know, everybody needs a team. We all need to be working together. Uh, to be successful, and we can handle. You know, listen. When you live, when you're doing your life mission, and you're out there uh, uh, with a passion, with a dream, and you're fully committed to it, 100%. Uh, 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 this is where you'll find happiness. And my my feeling is that, it, uh, uh, with this, especially with male and female relationships, because that's so important. This whole positive negative energy. When I say that, I don't mean good or bad. I'm talking about polarities. Letting you, one of your radio shows, you had mentioned about joining consciousness to consciousness and that the um, the woman being the the, the uh, reflection, the female reflection of the man and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And that is so true. You know, so we have to understand, you know, that uh, uh, the first woman, though, you must fall in love with outside of your mother <laughs> is Mother Nature. That's right. And, and once you fall in love with Mother Nature, and that's and this is where really all the secrets started to be uh, 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 revealed to me. Once I fell in love with her, and yes, you can actually have a love affair with Mother Nature. So the consciousness, it's a, it's a beingness uh, that you can connect to, it grounds you, it takes away, away the fear. For the most part, I mean, of course, we, we, we keep getting conditioned, condition, but you need that grounding with Mother Nature. When you have that level of fear with Mother Nature, now you learn how to live in harmony with Mother Nature. You begin to listen to Mother Nature. Your intuition uh, goes off the charts, and you, and, you, and you start to become a full person again. And so everybody, you know, uh, uh, you got to fall in love with Mother Nature, le learn to live in harmony with Mother Nature, listen uh, to the lessons that Mother Nature is trying to teach you, and um, uh, you'll be well on your way. And again, the path is different for everybody, but I'm, I'm telling you, once um, once I realized that Mother Nature was here to take care of us, Mother Nature, uh, like the Hootie Mahatra said on, on the radio show, Mother Nature's got you covered. It couldn't be, that was a, 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 a very profound. Mother Nature's got you covered she will embrace you if you embrace her and you know we do not li need to live in a culture where we're uh, killing uh you know well, we're killing humans obviously but we're killing animals uh, to you know millions and millions a day i mean we're living in a, a world a culture of death and it, it's not going to sustain life in any rational uh uh, uh, way, state, or form, and it's going to keep us warm with one another. So we, we, we you know, Mother Nature's way is a way of peace. So that female energy, that negative energy, that creative energy, uh, uh, that energy that grows the fruits and the, and the vegetables uh, uh, is wonderful. Now we got we got a, a, another thing that's going on of, of major concern to me is you know Mother Nature li likes to dress up. Always like to talk in terms of symbols and stories. She likes to dress up, but one of the things she has is a pair sunglasses they are the sexiest pair of sunglasses you've ever seen and they work flawlessly but we in our wisdom decided to mess with mother nature's sunglasses mm. but what are mother nature's sunglasses mother nature's sunglasses is the atmosphere the, the ozone layer the that's oxygen right. and nitrogen that's around the planet that is her sunglasses it is her filtering system right because not even she can take uh father sun's uh cosmic energies and uh, uh without filtering it first right and so now we're mess we're messing with the filter we have been for a, a 
number of years. Uh, anyone that goes out into the sun now and stands out there for a while in the stands, things have changed a little bit, uh, maybe a lot, uh, because it's hard to get information uh, about what's really going on. I mean, there's spraying stuff in the air. Who the hell you know knows what the, that's about? We know that's not good. Again, it's not something I, was, I sit around and um, uh, go, go into you know fear about, but I'm not. I'm, uh, uh, it's something to be certainly to apply some critical thinking to. All right, but we are definitely messing with Mother Nature's sunglasses, and therefore, when that filtering system gets screwed up with, of course, the, the, the light rays that come through now are changed just a little bit, and a little bit of change can screw everything up, right? And she's already perfect in what she's doing, and if we screw it up, guess what? Uh, and she's already talked to me about this. Of course, it's not in words. It's an in in intuition. She's done it before. She will simply shrug her shoulders and shake us all the hell out of here. All right? So if we don't wake up and, and start doing the right thing, uh, we're not going to survive. And guess what? This human race has been a, a number of times, from what I, what I can tell in my research and the studies of archaeology and, and, and the real history, rather than the fake history that we get in school, the real history shows us that man's been here probably a lot longer than we suspect, and there have probably been civilizations that have come and gone, mainly because they were living outside of Mother Nature for too long, causing major problems, and she's not going to tolerate it anymore. Mm. So we're going to get shook off. Uh, it's, she's got to survive. The planet's got to survive. So, uh, you know, we, so we can either continue down this path or we can get shook off and uh, start over again. So that's the, that, that's the choice right now. So I think right now the num there's a number, uh, uh, given the fact that we're now moving into a different uh, astrological address, right, as the, uh, 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 the whole solar system is moving around the galaxy. Of course, in the middle of the galaxy, we have a, a big black hole. And so it behooves everyone to study um Astronomy and even astrology to some extent, but you don't have to become an expert, just understand that everything is in motion, right? The atom right on up into the, the solar system that moves around this uh, black hole. And so we're changing addresses, and as we change addresses, we change frequencies. And these uh, uh, the frequencies right now are really stimulating the spiritual nature in us, all right? And I have a suspicion that the powers that be don't want that intuition and that and that spiritual side of us awakened, and so they're going to do whatever they can do. Now, listen, I've, I've worked on cadavers before, and you know, now that I'm talking about cadavers, I'll tell you a brief story about. Um, me going through anatomy class, and this is one uh, uh, major trauma, uh, but it wasn't for me, it was for my friends that came to see me, my best friend, and uh, my brother, who was a year younger than me, came to visit me up at Howard University, and I said, and they wanted to know, what, what, what are you learning, what is this medicine thing about, it's all mysterious, what are you doing? I said, well, let me, I said, I'm working on cadaver right now, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, dissecting the cadaver, let's, let's go to the anatomy lab, and I'll take you to the anatomy lab, we'll let you in, I'll let you see what's, what's going on, I'll explain to you what, what, some of the stuff that's inside your body, thinking that they, you know, they would have no problem with it, right? Because I'm already desensitized to it, right? Oh, I take it into a lab, all right? The lab is divided into two. On one side, there are nothing but heads on a, basically a metal stick. They're covered, and that was for the dental students. And then, then there's the uh, metal caskets, for lack of a better word, but it's, it's, uh, it's where we had the bodies in, in uh, the solution of formaldehyde, and you roll the, 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 the thing open, and the body rises up. And so I'm, 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 I'm raising the body up to this cadaver I was working on, and um, uh, my two, uh, I'm talking. I did, at, that, at that point, I, I thought they were still there. And I'm saying, okay, this is the bile duct. This is, I was teaching them about the GI system. Since we're going through the GI system, this is the celiac uh, 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 nerve plexus and blah, 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 blah. I must have talked for about, you know, I got into it for about 10, 10 minutes or so. I turned around, there was nobody there. There was nobody there. I could take it. Hey, listen, I can't. I, I put the body down, uh, turned off the lights, went outside. I'm like, what the hell happened to you guys, man? I was trying to teach you. They're like, no effing way. Mm. That's some Frankenstein shit going on in there. <laughs> and I laughed my head off at it. You know, listen, I mean, you know, the stuff that we get exposed to as doctors, uh, it really is not natural. Uh, and uh, so their reaction was really a quite natural reaction. 
you know, it's, uh, but, you know, hey, if you're going to make it through medical school, you better, you, you better suck it up and uh, deal with it. And so a lot of medical school is about uh, sucking it up and dealing with it. But it was, you know, it really, really to them it was, uh, it was Frankenstein's and it was insanity. Uh, and that has a way of also traumatizing you. Uh, you're breathing in formaldehyde. You're dealing with dead bodies. You're dealing with the culture of death. And, and, and so that, 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 that in itself, you, you become desensitized to death. You become desensitized to, uh, to life even. Uh, and, uh, you know, it starts, it starts down early uh, in medical school training. Actually, it starts even before then because as you, uh, uh, as we talked about before, the, um, just getting into medical school is traumatic. Um, I, I, I remember um, uh, my folks taking me to uh, Washington, D.C., Howard University. Uh, by the way, one of my favorite cities and one of my favorite uh, universities of all time. I love the place. Uh, and if it wasn't so cold, I'd, st- I'd probably still be there. <laughs> mm. uh, uh, don't like cold weather. I like the warm weather, so I'm out here in Southern California. But uh, that area was so rich with, uh, with knowledge of all kinds uh, that um, uh, I, that's, that's where I chose to go to school. I had a choice to go to Florida, uh, uh, like, down the University of Florida and, uh, and Howard, and ultimately um, by destiny ended up at Howard and was the best decision I made as far as what I wanted to pursue. Uh, little did I know uh, what I was in for. Uh, I will tell you this, if I knew now what I was about to go through, uh, and you asked me, would you do it again? I would say, no way, no how, it is not happening. <laughs> mm. All right, but in your ignorant state, uh, you go, you, 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 you know, hey, doctor is a good field. Uh, at the time, actually, you know, I had already studied, uh, and if you look at the resume, I don't know if, that's, if it's posted for, for, for anybody to be able to see, but uh, that I sent you, you'll notice the first three things says, uh, the Rose, Rose, Rosicrucian School of Metaphys- Metaphysics, excuse me. Second one, Astara School of Metaphysics. And number three, Mental Physics, which is a school of metaphysics, all right? At the core of all those schools is number one, awakening, and number two, breathing, breath. And I know you had a guest on the other uh, day, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dr. Fargo, who talked about the breath, and that, hey, the breath is a powerful thing. I mean, we have three mystery, at the time they call them mystery schools, but they were, today we refer to them as schools of metaphysics, all right? So I, I was already involved in that prior to coming to uh, school, coming out of high school. Um, I actually went, my brother's the one, first one that kind of knocked me on the head and said, hey, check this stuff out, and I, I took it and I ran with it. Uh, because it was the truth, you know, uh, uh, and you, uh, you know, you can alkalize, alkal- that's why I say one of the major things about the four, four tenets of health is oxygenation. When you learn how to control your breath, be, breathe properly, uh, this, um, uh, what she was talking about basically has been talked about for ages. It's been known for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, the, you know, the master yogis all are master of breathing. And it's like, man, breathing, you have to master breathing? Yes, because breathing comes along with the mental discipline. And see, it's the mental discipline along with the, the, the physical discipline that allows you. And it's, uh, the, the scientists call pranayama and, and, and yoga t- t- teachings, which is manipulating energy through thought and breath and so that's what they taught they didn't even teach anything about diet or anything they taught about all the other dimensions and so forth and so on and so i had a good grounding so by the time i got into school i was already kind of grounded in knowing that you know part of what i was about to embark on was not going to be uh, the, the be all and end all and actually i went to howard i went to school uh, uh, undergrad and medical school, really not with the, I, I didn't even think, I, I, I didn't, I never thought, I said, yeah, I want to be a medical doctor. No, I said, given what I'm, what I know now about myself, uh, 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 my spiritual development, my conscious awakening, uh, where, I, where I stand, I said, I want to learn now about this physical vehicle, right, and how to heal it how to keep it fresh, how to keep it rejuvenated, right? And so I said, I need some training on how to deal with the physical thing. And then uh, once I got that training, as traumatic as it was, uh, then I went and said, I need to know about the mind, the nervous system, the brain, uh, the psychology of things. And so then I, that's, and that's how I ended up being a, a, a neuropsychiatrist. It was really more like the last uh, frontier that I covered is where you, where you end up. 
All right, and of course, um, I didn't stop there. You know, I continued on uh, with my, uh, my metaphysical studies, and I also continued on with naturopathic healing methods, and uh, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, coming up with a system that works, uh, that works for me, and then also works for most of the patients that I, that I deal with. So, uh, we got. Uh, I had a guy come to me the other day. Um, now here I am, a neuropsychiatrist, and he's coming to me with gouty arthritis. I said, why are you coming to me? He said, well, because I heard that you were the best. He goes, I heard that you were a master healer. I said, oh, well, first of all, I don't even know what that means. I said, it's true that when I went into school, I thought that I was going to become a master healer, and that was really what my goal was. And now I realize that that, that, that too is a myth. There is no such thing as a master healer. Uh, anyone tells you they're a master healer, run in the, the other direction. There is no such thing as master healer. All right, ultimately, the master healer is going to be you, yourself, healing yourself uh, with the knowledge that you acquire. The, um, so this guy says, well, what are you? I said, I am a, uh, a master student of mm. the healing arts and a very humble servant at that. And so what, what is your problem? So he, he tells me I, I have the swelling in my toes and my fingers. I said, okay, you have gouty arthritis or what we term as gout. It's uric acid crystals. I said, do you know where these, uh, I said, does anyone explain to you or educated you as to what that is? No. Okay. It is deposits because you way too much meat, way too much protein, right? And your body can't handle it. It's depositing uric acid crystals into underneath the skin and between the joints, right? Creating an inflammation and creating pain. I said, so for two weeks, do you want to stop it? Yeah. Fruits and vegetables and water for two weeks. That's it. Mm. He started it really in just, I think, three days in the hospital. I said, I, I said, now if you want me to, I'll write for a vegetarian diet. He says, right for a vegetarian diet. I said, do not put sodas in your system, please, you know, for crying out loud. Let's not do that. Just water and vegetables. And this is hospital food. And in three days, he's already telling me he's feeling a lot better and the pain is gone. So he's not on any pain medicine. I said, good. Now, now, that you, now, now that you understand the power of how to address your body chemistry, now do it for 30 days. All right, get the fresher food, get the organic food, put it in your system on a consistent basis, and in 30 days, let me know how you're doing. All right, and he's never been back to the office since because he's healed. <laughs> mm. All right, now you go to a regular doctor, and he's going to give you uh, all these other kind of uh, uh, more chemicals uh, to make you more toxic. Uh, they might, uh, they, hey, listen, uh, uh, and, and I did um, a lot of clinical trials with uh, some of the big drug companies. Uh, they, they have their... They, they, some of them work in terms of giving you a, 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 an effect, but the toxic load that you get along with it is not worth it. All right. So, and, and nor, nor is it curative. All right. And so, when I'm dealing with people now, it's about cure. All right. We get to the cause. We get to the root. All right. We address that. All right. And and then and then the, the, the disease will uh, vanish on its own once you understand what the what the, the, the real cause is. And so uh, this is the thing uh, coming up with those four elements and, of course, the fifth element. So, uh, but, yeah, when I started out at, uh, at uh, Howard, I quickly uh, got into my head, but this is no joke. It is extremely, extremely competitive. So from day one, yes, you're not going to have a whole lot of fun, all right? You're going to spend four years essentially outperforming your buddies, the other people at the school with you and, and, and essentially other people in the country who are going to apply to medical school where you're going to apply to medical school. So it was no joke. I majored in um, zoology, uh, learned a lot about anatomy, structure, and function, and, uh, minor in chemistry, uh, where I learned about you know biochemistry and chemical reactions and so forth and so on. Uh, uh, that's why your, your guest that was talking about the, um, uh, uh, the um, these estrogen-forming compounds uh, you know, he's right on with that because, you know, I, I studied it. And so I know the chemical reactions. I know the, uh, what's being sprayed on the, on the crops right now. Um, uh, even uh, with the um, organic foods, you have to be careful. Matter of fact, you have to be careful with the whole alternative uh, health movement because there's a scam there too. All right? People are coming to me saying, hey, I'm taking this herb, I'm taking this vitamins and so forth and so on. I said, let me see that stuff. Uh, magnesium, steroid, binders, pills. I said, you know this stuff is toxic? I said, yeah, it says spirulina, and spirulina is, hey, one of my top recommendations, uh, especially if you're 100% uh, uh, vegan, uh, because it's so high in B12 and protein. I said, but 
give I said, first of all, you don't know when this stuff was made. You don't know how fresh this stuff is. I said, and it's, uh, I said, most of these companies use these toxic flowing agents because it, a lot, it keeps machines from getting gummed up. And a lot of these herbs and stuff will gum up machines uh, if they don't go slow. And they want them to go fast because it's all about the dollar bill. And so you end up with these, uh, you, know, you see magnesium stearate, you see uh, binders and fillers of uh, different names. And I just looked up, more, I just happened to look up magnesium stearate. And no, that stuff has to get transferred in the, in the, in the hazmat truck with the, with the skull and the, and the bones across it. Mm. Toxic, right? And it's going in to your spirulina, right? Which spirulina, uh, by its, in and of itself, and by itself is a, is a great herb to take. It's an allergy, actually. Uh, it's great to take, and I take it every day because, again, it is almost 65% protein, and the vitamin B12 levels are sky high, and so is the iron. So for anybody that's a vegetarian, I mean, you should have Corella, Sun Corella, or the um, – or the spirulina is part of your diet at least three three times a week, if not every day. You don't have to do a, a ton of it, but it really just kind of uh, plugs in the holes, uh, especially if you're uh, of a vegan diet and um, uh, raw food. And like I said, uh, when I went raw food after Mother Nature started instructing me, and see, um, I started taking my marching orders from her, I, I went 90% uh, raw food, and I, all I can say is that the results are miraculous. And so when these people try to debunk this type of eating, hey, listen, if you can get the food, know how to supplement properly, understand how to read the labels, and you don't buy nonsense. I mean, most of the stuff you can get in just buying organic raw food. It's, you can cook some of your food. It's not a it's not it's not a, not a sin to cook food. It's not a sin to eat beer. I mean, you know, you don't you don't make a religion out of it. I mean, I see on YouTube a lot of this mo this uh, so called movement. I mean, it's not a religion, folks. Uh, you, you use your common sense. You use the knowledge that you have. You, you, you know, nothing is going to be a hundred percent. So, like I said, I'm I'm ninety percent raw food, but you know, I still ten percent of the other thing. I mean, once on a blue moon, I might have a piece of salmon, small. I might have some uh, chicken, uh, a little bit small. It's not 100%, uh, but it's, 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 it's moving that way. And eventually, even that, I'll, I'll reach a point where even that clears out. I know that I, you know, there's deeper uh, uh, levels to go to. And, you know, I've discovered that there's a definite relationship between your diet, carry practices, and alkalinization of the body, and oxygenation of the body, and your own spiritual awareness. Your consciousness gets affected. And your vibration begins to change, all right? And everything ultimately healing is frequency and vibration, right? And this, uh, these fruits and these vegetables, these little light beings, I refer to them, actually begin to tell your body to get back into harmony. So it, 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 it harmonizes with nature. Your body is of nature. And the fruits and the vegetables and the herbs and the algaes and the, and the, and the, and the mushrooms um, there's uh, something that I want to mention because I'll probably forget it, and um, I should mention it now before we get deeper into uh, uh, the training of doctors. And um, if my phone gives out uh, 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 and you start hearing some weird noises, I have a couple of phones here. I'll just have to change, but it may make a, a, a noise. The um, uh, you know we, we we're dealing with um, where, where 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 do toxins come from? So we deal with number one chemical toxins, all right. Um, uh, number two, electromagnetic toxins, right? Which microwaves is one, by the way. Uh, but uh, of course, we know about uh, nuclear toxins. I mean, Fukushima is an example. But of course, you know, they're using that as a, a fear-based mind control program. Yeah, that's well. right. That's right. Uh, you know, if uh, you know Fukushima was as bad as it was, we all be dead already. <laughs> it's already in six states. <laughs> all all the cows and are good. We don't need to be eating the cows or drinking the milk anyway. <laughs> Anyone here who's still on dairy, please get off the dairy. I don't care if you get raw organic dairy. Don't drink it. Mm. <laughs> it is not for human beings. That's Trust right. Me. That's for uh, baby cows. The, That's right. Uh, uh, you know, I was an athlete, and I still am an athlete. I played a lot of basketball. I played basketball in high school. I did some in college, not uh, uh, competitively, but uh, intramural. And uh, it was one of the things that kept my sanity as I was training and going through school. And uh, the minute I started, and there, I, mean, I used to love me some cheese. Uh, I'm from New York. You know, the pizza in New York is, 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 is uh, off the hook, except <laughs> cheese is dairy. And I didn't realize that the dairy was setting up an inflammatory process in my body. So the body is constantly in, in, inflamed. When I look up what 
uh, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, people of color, uh, uh, and the, the research is out there. It's, it's, it's not that hard to find, but you have to know to look for it. And it's saying, yeah, uh, black folks shouldn't be eating um, uh, dairy past the age of two. And I'm like, yeah, we probably shouldn't be starting on it in the first damn place. It's breast milk and then to, to some fruits and vegetables. <laughs> well, right. What's wrong with that? Mm. Uh, uh, but, yeah, when, when I got off the dairy, I had chronic Achilles tendonitis from playing a lot of basketball. And um, I just remember getting off dairy, and maybe two months later, um, I got up, and I'm walking around, going up and down the stairs, and I said, you know what? I don't have any pain anymore. And But it didn't occur to me because it was just so natural not to have the pain. You know, the unnatural thing is we walking around with pain. And uh, so it took me a while to realize I didn't have the pain anymore. And then that's what I realized. And I did more, re- and then I did extensive research on milk. And I, I started learning about what's in the milk. Uh, what do they do with the milk? I mean, you, you, I mean, you know, listen, no, there's nothing in, in nature that has fat that's supposed to float to the top. Or, uh, you know, when I was a kid, milk came in a, a glass carton. It was all organic, by the way, at that time. You didn't have to worry about orga- organicity. And the um, uh, cream floated to the top. And even that's not good for you. But the stuff of, of today, where the cows are being pumped full of hormones, chemicals, slaughtered, uh, you know, uh, inhumanely. We're getting the antibiotics. Uh, the udders of these uh, things are uh, infected, and this is why they have to heat it and uh, homogenize it. And it's like when you heat something to that level, you're killing all the enzymes and any good stuff in there anyway, the good stuff and the bad stuff, and thank God, because the udders of these cows are all infected. Um, the uh, next thing is, is because the milk is, has fat, all the fat-soluble toxins that are being pumped into these uh, cows come into the milk, right? And now you go to the store, you buy milk, you stick it in your refrigerator, you come back the next day, of course, it's in a carton. Uh, there is no cream at the top. Now, how come the cream does not float to the top like it should? And like it did in the past, 20, just 20, 25 years ago. It doesn't because of the process of homogenization. And people think that's just spinning down the fat and, and, and dis, uh, dispersing the fat throughout the milk. Uh-uh. Ain't that simple, folks. Because if that's all it was, in a couple of days, that, milk, that fat would be floating right back up to the top of the milk. The chemical structure of the milk has changed, and this is why it causes major, major problems, especially in black folks, but in everybody. I mean, nobody should be drinking milk. Period. I mean, it is, um, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's one of the worst things uh, that you can put in your body, man. And, and, and remember, it was one of my three leading causes of heart disease is milk, <laughs> all right, because of the inflammation. So uh, you, you got to get off of the milk. But um, uh, so getting back to the, uh, to the training, the um, – um, uh, oh, I just want to mention the, 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 the finish up with the toxins. So everybody talks about uh, the electromagnetic toxins, the chemical toxins. Uh, pretty much everybody knows about that. Like EMF, uh, electromagnetic frequencies coming from computers, coming from TVs, surrounded by it, coming from power lines. And when you go up in a plane, there's a, a ton of the uh, uh, electromagnetic frequencies that are disharmonic to our bodies. Uh, so it's something to be looked at. I mean, you don't want to be sleeping with the computer right next to you. Uh, uh, if you do go to bed with the computers, turn off the uh, turn off the wireless connection because it'll it, it'll it'll drop the uh, EMFs by 90%. Uh, don't put a TV in your bedroom. All right, and I've been guilty of that. <laughs> uh, there is no TV in my bedroom anymore. So no better, you do better. All right. Um, uh, the uh, the next one really is uh, something that a lot of people don't talk about, and they have experts on this now, is noise toxicity or noise pollution. And, you know, we would, especially in the cities, so used to the noises and the sounds and the sirens and the this and the that and the other. Uh, and if you move outside of that city and you get into a country area uh, and you hear nothing, you hear no sounds except maybe a dog barking and the coyotes uh, at times. But that peaceful quietness, man, is nothing like it. All right? And this is why I moved out to an area. It's just right outside of L.A. called Fillmore. Uh, and everybody said, why are you going out there, man? It's country and they ride horses out there. I said, because it's close enough to, for me to get to where I need to get to. And it's far enough out where I can get some some quiet. And there's nothing like quiet. The noise pollution can drive you nuts. All right? 
Uh, and it's one of my prescriptions for people who are going through mental problems. I said, you got to get, you have to get into some, some peace and quiet. All right. And you got to reestablish your connection with nature. I mean, when's the last time you walked barefoot? When's the last time you even touched a tree? When's the last time you've been in a lake? You know, you got to get back, you got to get back into nature. Um, uh, now, another one that people don't talk about is the nanotechnology. And so we have a new form of, uh, of toxicity in the form of, of nanotechnology. And that itself is a whole show, uh, Lennon, uh, uh, and there's probably uh, experts that are better at uh, discussing that. But it, it gets into transhumanism, but it's deeper than that. It is actually out already. It's in the air. Uh, we're, we're taking it in. I mean, I don't think any of us have not been affected by nanotechnology. Uh, uh, listen, uh, this, this whole movement with um, this vaccinations, which I find disgusting, uh, I've not been vaccinated since, I don't know. So, uh, I, listen, when they first tried to vaccinate me as a child, they had a hell of a time. It took two people to hold me down. I fought the whole way through. Uh, ultimately, my folks said we probably should not vaccinate him anymore. Uh, so I didn't get the full, the full Monty of it, man, because hey, literally I was kicking, fighting. You know, no, you better not be injecting no shit into me that I don't know about. And it, doesn't, it just didn't seem right. You know, even as a child, it didn't seem right. Um, uh, I have a, a, a daughter that's going to be five soon, and she's never been vaccinated, nor will she ever be. And, you know, this nonsense about flu vaccines, we know the vaccines don't work. We know that they're toxic, and we know that they're carrying stuff, and we know that nanotechnology is in the vaccines. All right? So you probably heard it here first. It's a new it's a new form of talk, not that we go out and become afraid. No, we just don't take the vaccine. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't inject your kids with nonsense. You don't inject uh, – listen – and I, I'd be the first one to say, hey, you know what? Vaccines are good. I've looked at the science. I've studied the science. I've looked at the, uh, how, how vaccines work. They're, 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 they're wonderful. They're perfect. Uh, it's backed up. Good to go. Uh-uh. It's not that way. The research is tenuous at best. Uh, the stuff that they're putting into the vaccines is toxic. I mean, I just um, I have a list of seven foods I tell people never to eat. Uh, but they, um, they used to use uh, peanuts as a, uh, a carrier. Uh, the peanut oil is a carrier, so this, uh, uh, when they inject you, uh, your body actually forms an allergic reaction to it, and this is why people now can eat, eat one peanut can kill somebody. That's right. right? Because, they're, because they're being injected. I know you had the uh, lady that was on uh, with the, um, uh, talking about the vaccines, and she was right on. Mm -hmm. Mary Toko. The thing, is, the thing mm -hmm. is, nobody is going to pay as much attention to her as they do to me because I have the science behind it, and, I'm, and, I, and I carry the title, see? So, but I back her up 100%. You know, and she's teaching me stuff. I'm like, yeah, that's, I didn't even know that. Mm. Thank God for her. I, I can't remember her name. That was Mary Toko. That was Mary Toko, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the great, uh, great, great, and there's a couple, there's, a, there's others out there, and there is a, another medical doctor out there who um, uh, uh, started coming out, um, out in uh, England and started really speaking out against the uh, uh, vaccinations. But my thing is, uh, free vaccines? Now, you know, People don't give away things for free, especially the government, <laughs> unless they want to control you or somehow manipulate you. Right? Right. Nothing is free, folks. Free money, welfare, all that is all designed to control, keep your mind thinking little. See, we keep, we stay small. Uh, you know, I, I tell a lot of my patients, I said, you, you're running around, you're coming to me, running around in this little uh, rat trap, in this uh, uh, in this circular pattern going nowhere, in this little maze, and then uh, and they drop a little piece of cheese and you're happy, right? I said, and then if the cheese the next time that they drop it in there is a little less, now you're pissed off, and if it's a little more, then you're happy again. Mm. I said, but you're being controlled and manipulated by the government, by this, by, by this maze, and yet you're going around and around. You come to me, and you say, please make me feel better in this rat race that I'm in, in this, in, in, where I'm going nowhere. I'm, I'm, I'm just zero, and, and, and I'm getting my little cheese. And I'm like, I said, you really, I, I said, do you really think I can get you better uh, mentally or physically? If you're, if, you're, if you're content to run around under this trap, and if you don't even realize who you're trapped, and that's why I say we got an identity crisis. You, folks, you need to wake up, all right? Because, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. I can't make you better uh, if you want to stay. If you, it's like, hey, just make me feel better while I stay in the same state of consciousness, all right? And I stay in this little, little rat track game, game, and I said, no, you need to wake the hell up. And you should be you, you should be thinking about owning the cheese factory, not taking the little pieces of cheese that they give you. To mm. 
control you with, all right? I said, you got to think big, all right? Uh, and w when you think big and you, and you do your mission, you, you're going to get everybody, you're going to get paid, especially if we all work together. Uh, we're going to get paid. Everybody can get rich. It's not, it's not, the money is a wash. The world is a wash of money. It ain't that difficult. Uh, trust me, uh, we can get paid. It's just a, how creative are you going to be? And are you going to share it with people because you can't do it by yourself? You might, must have help. All right, we, do, we have to do it by team, a team and a team and a team. And I, I think that's one of my attractions to basketball, the team sports. I learned early on, can't do it by yourself. There are no heroes. You must have a team that you're working with. Um, uh, you go into business, you got to have a team. You know, you cannot do it alone. If, if you're a one-man show trying to do it alone, uh, uh, good luck because uh, it don't work that way. You got to put a good team, a good good team of people behind you. And if you can't find a good team of people, then that's when you start to uh, uh, network with people like us. And uh, uh, you know, you have my email. Anyone can email me at any time about any question, health or otherwise. And uh, I'll, be, I'll be happy to return the, the emails uh, to, to all your listeners. That's a that's a promise. Um, you know, right now I have nothing to sell. There's nothing to buy from me. There's not even a book. It's not even written. I mean, it's being written, but uh, it's not. It's not for sale. There's no ebook. There's no website to go to where I'm selling you this, that, and the other. It's not going to happen. Uh, it's, it's, it's not there. All right. Well, it might, might might something like that happen later. Maybe if I think this, if if that's where uh, my consciousness is t taking me. Uh, but we'll all get paid when we do what we're supposed to be doing. All right, which is living out your dreams, li living out your soul mission, and uh, uh, connecting to, to to other people, helping other people. Uh, all right, and doing what you're doing, what's inside of your heart, and you be at the, It has to be your passion, has to be your love, and if you're, if, and and so people are coming to me in a dreamless state, and I'm like, how can I help you if you have no dream? Mm. I said you're dreamless. I said now, I can help you if you have a dream. All right, but. I, there's no way I can give you a dream. There's no way I can give you that passion, you know, but yet you wonder why you're depressed, right? So, you know, I get a lot of folks coming in the office, uh, in the hospital, depressed, suicidal. I say, I say, because you're dreamless. What do you mean? I said, take a pencil and paper, write six things out that you're interested in. And I thought some folks discovered, I had a lady the other day uh, uh, tell me that, she, that life is just boring, she's got nothing to do. I said, well, what are you doing now? She goes, well, I just go to the hospital. And I see this guy who was a friend of mine who got into cracks. I mean, he's a quadriplegic. And I said, well, first of all, uh, 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 there's some ways of de dealing with that outside of what just what modern medicine is doing, because they'll, they'll tell you it's a hopeless case when, in fact, it is not hopeless. I said, but I said, that's all you're doing? She goes, yeah. I said, you have nothing that you're in. She said, well, you know, back while I was a, a concert violinist, I said, do you still have the violin at home? Yeah. I said, why don't you take that violin, go to the hospital, which is, mm -hmm. we know that the hospital right now is a vibration of negativity. Folks, if you ever have to go to the hospital, get in and get the hell out as quick as you can. Trust me, all right? It is a, it is a vibration of negativity, all right? Uh, are the intentions good? Yes, the intentions are good, but it don't matter. There's a lot of death. There's a lot of sickness. And, of course, that vibration permeates the entire hospital, all right? And what, that's why I get I, I do my work and I get the hell out of it. It does not become social hour for me. I get in, I get out, especially for the hospital. Office outpatient is different. That's much more a positive environment because I have much more control over that. The hospital is not a place that you want to spend a lot of time. But I said, get the violin. The frequencies and the sound will probably help your friend. Also, it'll probably help the other patients that are around there. So and and it'll get you back into what your passion was, which was music, right? So your creativity. And it's just simple things like that that people, you know, just, you know, they just uh, forget the, the, what their passion was. I said, but you can't come to me dreamless and expect that I can help you because I cannot. I said, I cannot give you the dream because only you can give yourself the dream. Only you can t uh, uh, tell yourself what, what it is that you love and what it is that you're passionate about. But the um, uh, getting back to the medical training, uh, just, just going through that first four years, you are in competition constantly with your fellow man. So by the time I get out of this competition, I did, grad, I, like I said, zoology and chemistry, uh, magna cum laude. The guy that was ahead of me was my study partner. He, I think I graduated with 3.75 or 7.6 grade point average, and he graduated with 3.78. So, and he uh, also got into medical school as well. <laughs> uh, he did not complete medical school, but he got into medical school. Uh, so you, it's, everything is about competition. So at Howard, 
Uh, there were 140 spots open, uh, 5,000 plus applications, mm. right? And uh, uh, you just hoped and prayed uh, that you did enough competing, that you competed well. Uh, again, there's not a whole lot of time for party time and this, that, and the other. I mean, it is a marathon push just to get in. Uh, uh, so there, you don't, you don't, you don't, you make friends, but you don't have any close friends because, again, your your constant thought is this competition. So the programming starts even before you get there, right? As though you're getting to something that's, you know, so mysterious and so special that you know nobody else can get in there, but you, you know, if you if you're the chosen one. Mm. We had 140 accepted. By the time the four years was up, 90 graduated. So that means we lost 50. There will be times I'd be sitting in school, uh, and I would always sit near the front. You know, I was one of those guys. I got to hear you. I got to look at you. I got to see what you're talking about. I got to feel the energy. And um, come back in after a semester, uh, where's so-and-so? Well, so-and-so didn't make it. What do you mean he didn't make it? No, he, they, they kicked him out of school. Mm. Kicked him out of school? Uh, why was that? Well, it just so happens at this particular school, and most medical schools, um, they're, they're not as brutal now as they were, uh, that you get you get kicked out if you fail one class. They will allow you to retake it. If you retake it and fail it again, you are done. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You're done. So you're watching people who you're connected to, who are helping you, who you're studying with, who, you know, everybody's interdependent on everybody uh, there. Uh, uh, they're just gone. Just gone. That creates tension. That creates uh, fear. That creates worry. Right? And, of course, now you're you've got all this competitive energy in you, you've got worry and fear in you. All right, you're watching your classmates fall like flies. Like I said, 50 over uh, over four year period. All right, you're doing stuff that's unnatural. I'll tell you one of the, the things that really uh, was traumatic for me because I'm an animal lover, and so we go into this uh, suture class. We're learning how to suture. And guess who the future uh, victims were? Hmm. It wasn't just some fake skin that you can just learn your technique on. No, it was live dogs. I'm like, oh, this this, this is not going to work for me, folks. No, you're going to do it or you will not be in school. So I had to do something that was completely against my nature, completely traumatic to me. Now, uh, you, they're, 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 I, I believe, uh, I was reading recently that at some schools they allow you to opt out of that. All right? So, you know, Come on, man. Uh, dogs, you're basically killing the dogs. You, you're practicing on dogs. I, it's, it's, it's supposedly for the sake of, um, you know, helping people. And in a way it is, but in a way it's not because you don't really need the dogs uh, uh, to do that. Well, right? well, can you can you give us, some, can you tell us how that works? So you you come in and, and, and what, is it, what does it look like? A dog is on a, you know, strap tool? No, 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 Lena, it's a whole room of dogs on these uh, uh Really, dog beds. Really, really, what it is is like the dogs are the patients. They're hooked up to um, uh, anesthesia, so they're, they're asleep. They don't feel anything, and you have to make the incisions. You have to clean up the wound, and then you have to suture the wound, All right? And uh, uh, and then you have the instructors coming around in this lab, the dog lab, the suture lab, uh, grading you on how well you've sutured. I'm like, hell, I don't even want to be a surgeon. Do I need to do this? Shit? Wow. <laughs> you know. And uh, it had that 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 had uh, that was one of the worst things I had to do in school. But you know, it's it's not just the one thing. It's 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 it's, it's that. It's um, listen. We had a um, a lady, a uh, young lady who who was uh, from the um, Bahamas. She was failing uh, pharmacy, and uh, you know, which in medicine that's a no no. You must do well in in, in your pharmaceutical classes, and they. Um, the, uh, the the pharmacy instructor said, okay, listen, I can help you out. And essentially, he made a sexual offer to her, which she took him up on. And they had this affair um, while her grades were fixed for uh, a number of years, um, maybe not even a year, maybe a year and a half. Um, uh, I didn't know anything about it. I mean, some people did. I, you know, I, uh, and all of a sudden, uh, we found out that Dr. Uh, G, uh, I won't say his full name, but Dr. G, was shot. Well, wow, what the hell happened? Your fellow classmate just shot him. Wow. Because she found out that he was married. Hmm. And she snapped, right? 
and shot this guy who then three months later is dead. Right? And he was actually a very good instructor, to be honest with you. He was one of the best instructors I had to run into. Uh, uh, you know, uh, so you have tragedies like that. We had a lady who um, gave a patient who came in with low potassium an injection, uh, IV push of potassium uh, uh, that you should never do because the heart is very sensitive to potassium. So even the potassium low or high, whatever adjustments you're going to make to potassium, has to be done slowly over hours and sometimes days, but certainly slow, all right? Well, she gave a push and killed the patient, all right? Uh, she was put on suspension, not kicked, not kicked out of school, not kicked out of her uh, uh, training, um, and uh, she ended up uh, shooting herself in the head. Another guy who um, just got so distraught with the school, he, he couldn't pull out because there's so much pressure from the families and expectation. There's a lot of money invested. There's a lot of time invested. And he essentially became an alcoholic and found himself on the freeway, uh, decapitated as he drove his car into a, um, a truck. And you know, the truck has those T-bars on the bottom. He had a little, little small alpha male type of cars, a spider type of cars, and as he was decapitated. All right, so there's a lot of tragedies that I've been through. I had a, uh, my, one of my good, good friends, uh, who uh, um, this was this this was uh, uh, became public. Uh, who uh, uh, went through uh, medical school, um, uh, went through uh, 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 pediatrics, and then became a neonatologist. That it was a good choice for him because ultimately it, it's the reason why he's alive today. But he was married. I believe it was now his second marriage. Uh, uh, too bad your 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 uh, your videos weren't out then, uh, Lennon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you might have learned how to form a positive uh, female relationship, but it's a tra- it's tragedy. I shouldn't need to laugh. It's it's tragedy because I, I lived with him and his family when I first came to Southern California for about three months. I knew the family well, very intimate. The family, uh, Kevin. I mean, uh, you can go look up on the internet right now. Go to Amazon. Death of a Doctor. Um, who's the uh, author? Of that give me a second, guys. So, I'll tell you who that is. It's an interesting read. Uh, and this guy, um, uh, yeah, this was uh, by Carlton Smith. And he would always uh, follow interesting murder cases. So I've already kind of given away the plot line that he, you know, working seven days a week. Uh, this woman got pregnant as he was having an affair with her and uh, start, started talking about, well, yeah, we can have a practice together and this and that and the other. And st- again, Something snaps in his head where he decides to take her out to Angela's Crest Forest, uh, uh, choked her with a Snoopy tie because, again, he's dealing with kids all day and young and the parents of kids, and he's a pediatrician, but he's a neonatologist, and uh, choked her to death, killed her, set her truck on fire, uh, Mercedes, and then pushed it over in the middle of the night in Angela's Crest, Angela's Crest Forest. Well, in the middle of the night, that burning truck lights up like, you know, like the morning sky. So everybody sees it. He tries to take off. Uh, ultimately, uh, he spun out because he was uh, very reckless and uh, was stuck. Another guy, an older guy, came tried to help him. They didn't know that he had murdered somebody. And they ended up both get taken into, uh, they both got caught and taken in. Ultimately, the other guy was released and he's, he's up on murder charges. Uh, found out that she was pregnant uh, with his baby. And I think that's what the thing that made him snap. Uh, but again, his mind was not right because you come out of if you come out of, of medical school and you, then you go into the specialty thing, you the, the, you you got to you've got to have some balance in your life. And without that balance, you're gonna be you're gonna be like a mad scientist, right? And this is what we deal with, you know, on a daily basis, mad scientists. I mean, we have people who who uh, crack. We had a guy. Uh, so anyway, you read Death to the Doctor. It's a murder about my friend, about uh, him murdering somebody. He would have gotten the death penalty except the fact that all the babies that he saved in his practice of neonatologist, they stood outside the courtroom in, in, um, in Pasadena. And, I mean, there was many of them. There was many of them, six, 700 of them, said, no, we can't do it because he, he saved so many lives. We can't do it. So he got he got uh, in, uh, a prison without the uh, possibility of parole. So he's in prison today. Mm. You know, the guy who I was very close to, and it was very upsetting to find out that that happened. And you, you have to think, how did that happen? Yeah. Well, this guy got a lot of money. He's successful. He's a doctor. He's a neonatologist. He's saving people's lives. I mean, you know, you're getting, you know, and yet, 
somehow your mind snaps, all right? That means that there's some mental instability there uh, that probably wasn't there before, all right? Um, the, um, you know, the girl that uh, shoots herself in the head because she killed a patient. I mean, this is not normal stuff, you know. Um, if I killed a patient by accident, you know, of course it's traumatic, uh, but I'm not going to kill myself. Hmm. You know, I'm going to learn from the mistake and I guarantee I'll never make that mistake again and we'll deal with whatever the consequences are, you know. But uh, as far as uh, killing myself or killing somebody else, you know, that that's insanity. But I will say that I had an advantage in that I was a little bit more grounded because I had gone through these uh, metaphysical training and I understood that you can only bite off so much of this stuff, man, because it's toxic, you know. And uh, by the time I got out of school, and again, it's a marathon. I mean, the way they train the doctors, it's a marathon. Uh, uh, it's very a few, few breaks. You, uh, you're going through now techniques of sleep deprivation. Can you um, wait, can you explain that? So, okay, so you said sleep deprivation. What would be like a normal day at that point in, in your career? Uh, oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, it depends on what stage you are at your training, and it gets progressively worse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, as a student, as a student, the typical day would be in school by 8.30, all right, uh, out by about 4.30, 5 o'clock, all right, uh, you would eat your food, and then you would essentially spend the rest of the day studying until about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, get up again. Uh, 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 and of course, you got to be to school. Nobody lives at school, so you got to drive to school or get a ride to school. And so you're you're you're, get, you're going on about uh, you know on a, on a on a good day, three and a half to four hours of sleep, mm. uh, five days a week. But on the weekends that you have off, you are still studying fourteen, fifteen, sixteen hours just to keep up. All right, and they're throwing all this uh, 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 organic chemistry, biochemistry, endocrinology, uh, anatomy, you name it. Uh, if it deals with medicine, there it was. Uh, there were some things that were missing, missing out of there, which is uh, what happened to nutrition. How come there's nothing about nutrition? There was nothing about nutrition. No, there was everything about the drugs and so forth and so on. And so I knew uh, not to take, take it that seriously. And, I, you know, I learned to laugh. I would get uh, calls from guys, you know, crazy hours, 3 o'clock. Man, I'm tripping out. It's, 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 I'm just not going to make it. Um. I'm like, uh, what are you talking about, man? He goes, none of it's making any sense anymore. We were doing uh, pathology at the time. It's not making any sense. I'm looking at these. I, I can't make I said, hey, man, first of all, you're experiencing burnout. Chill out. I said, if you're experiencing burnout and you're afraid and you can't do it, guess what? Everybody else is in the same situation, so chill out. We're all tripped out right now. Wow. So, hey, you know, but, I mean, this guy was losing it, mm -hmm. you know, and I had to talk him down, you mm. know. Again, again, and then there were times where I was super stressed out, but I never took the apple and took a big chunk out of it. Just enough so I can move on, right? Mm. Was smart enough and intelligent enough where I could put concepts together where I when it came exam time and that's another trip in and of itself. Listen, we had uh, exams. They would take you to the special room in a special building that you had never been to before called the Red Room. Mm. And you would pile up like, like sheeple, like cattle, outside of the Red Room, right? And you got you got a, a hundred and something students all together about to take a big exam and you know if you don't pass this exam you don't get to move on right yeah and, and there's a good chance you could get kicked out of school right so everybody's super stressed i mean the energy in that room was so negative and so full of fear and toxic it was uh, unbelievable and you know i just took it as normal okay we just stay in here uh and then all of a sudden after about and you would stay in there they would have you there for about a good 30 minutes and then they would let you into the exam room. Then you would take the exam after you had this congestion of energy. And I, you know, it wasn't until I started looking at, you know, mind control and manipulation of some of these videos and stuff that you put up that I said, man, that was a mind control thing. Mm. There was no reason why the door shouldn't be open. We go in, take our seats, wait. If we have to wait 30 minutes before they want to give us the exam, that's fine. Why did they put us in this thing with all this energy and everybody's tripping out and everybody's worried and did you study that? And that? You know, it was just uh, ridiculous, you know. Uh, 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 but again, you don't know what you're going through until you get to reflect upon it later on. But that red room, 
man, and I wanted to color red. Wow. So the room itself was red? The room itself was red. Oh, was wow. Red room. Outside it was red. Inside it was red. The walls were red. The, uh, the, the chairs were red. And see, it wasn't until I actually started listening to it, I'm like, red? Yeah. I mean, there's a reason why the damn thing was called the Red Room and why it was red. I mean, to this day, I'm, I'm not quite sure why they used the color red. Uh, uh, you probably could tell me more than what I know about, but I know that there was a reason for that room being red. There was a reason for us to be uh, uh, shackled up like cows uh, 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 going to the slaughter right before. And listen, they were trying their best to knock you out of the game. It, beca it became a game of stamina, not a game of intelligence. It, it did not become, it was not a game of caring. Nobody cared if you cared. All right? It was not a game of, uh, uh, it was a game of intelligence. Yes, you did have to have some, some smarts about you. Otherwise, you would not be able to put the information together and pass those exams. Uh, and you had to be, it was a game more of how do you function under tremendous stress. Yeah. All right? And this is why 50 folks bit the dust. Mm. And actually, it was a little bit more than that because we got a we got a couple of people transferring, maybe like four or five. So really, it was a fifty-five bit the dust, and then we had some we had some transfers, right? And uh, you know, Howard University is funny; it's a, a primary black university, but once you get into the professional schools, hey, if you can get in school, they had white, black, green, yellow, every every color race that was there at the at the uh, at the professional level at the medical school. Man, you go where they accept you. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, I never understood. I'm like, man, that was a, that, that that is ridiculous. That and how, how often? How often what were those tests uh, being taken? Oh, oh, once every once every three months, mm -hmm. you would have to hit the red room. Yeah, once every three months. Okay, so then the, 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 almost like a compression would have to take place prior to that three month period where you have to study, study, study. But the, but you're, besides you're, that, you're still you're doing. You're sleep deprived. You're not. Uh, most most of, most of the folks weren't work, working out. I, I was smart enough where I ran two miles every day, so I kept myself in some sort of shape. Uh, um, uh, especially during the first two years. The second two years, it was no working out. It was. It became just a complete uh, rat race. Uh, uh, um, um, things got turned up a level because then you go into your clinical uh, part, but you're still dealing with the academia too. So you have to go to class and go deal with uh, uh, live patients. Uh, uh, and that in itself is stressful because you don't know what the hell you're doing at that point. And yet they're letting you, le you loose on, the, on these patients. <laughs> oh, okay, you explain that. So, so what you're saying that even at that time when you were dealing with pac uh, patients, it's not that uh, people were prepared or that medical students are actually prepared to handle that, but you're still let loose to be able to engage patients. You're, yeah, you're, you're let loose. Uh, you have uh, you have a resident or something that's uh, watching over you, uh, but you 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 know you're making decisions. Uh, you have uh, you know you're you're basically a, at that point a junior doctor, all right? Uh, you have some book knowledge, but you have very little patient care knowledge, and yet you're let loose and so now you know you have life and death uh, in your hands but listen I, I we talk about sleep deprivation i'll give you one story uh that uh, just sticks with me that was a, a, a personal thing that happened to me uh you know once you graduate school uh you go into what's called the internship you know an internship and then this was that was the, probably the biggest nightmare uh for everybody and it was at the end of that internship was when i changed my name uh you know on a conscious level uh, uh because i knew that i had at least Whatever I had at that point, they couldn't take it away. Mm. The knowledge that I came for, I marked it with a symbol with a name change, and then I moved on to, you know, continue my, 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 my uh, over the USC. But that internship, I can remember the sleep deprivation was crazy. You were, listen, um, I almost killed myself in an accident. Um, the 36 hour shifts, uh, at the pediatrics ward. You're watching kids die of cancer. Uh, death becomes, you know, just, a run in the mill thing, you get used to it. Uh, uh, sick kids dying, sick kids with cancer, losing their hair. I mean, this is, a, you know, uh, going into uh, being the second assistant, a surgeon, where you got guts in your hands. You're holding guts in your hands, you're putting them down while they do a colon resectomy. You know, it's not normal, it's not natural, but hey, it's what you have to do. All right? So, you, you, it's, it's, you know, it's just like my brother and my best friend said, it's like Frankenstein. <laughs> mm. But you're really being you being exposed to things that no normal person would ever be exposed to. Yeah, can, can you speak on the sleep deprivation? You said 36 hour shifts. Yeah. Now 36 hour shifts, and I remember getting into a um, uh, uh, car 
and going to visit my uh, a girlfriend because I was off, you know, I have the 36 hour shift, you have 24 off. And so I went to visit her, got into an argument with her. <laughs> and instead of staying there and working it out, no, I'm going to drive back to the hospital and sleep in the dorm. On the way back, I fall asleep. My car goes up the 10 freeway, completely off, rolls off. I, I had the thing on cruise control. And so here, here I am, upside down. I woke up, and I thought I was in a dream. I really had no idea that I had actually been into a, a major crash. Wow. I like kicked myself out of the glass, call, I cut my chest up a little bit, call, call out, and uh, uh, I got away from the car because it's still on and it's gas leaking up. I think the car's gonna explode. And then certain people, the people that saw me go off are coming in and say, hey, is that guy in there alive? Because they, they didn't think I was the guy. That guy had to be dead. That went off the freeway at 65 miles an hour, you know, uh, with the car upside down and the gas leaking out, you know. And I remember I said, no, that guy is me and I have to do something. I went back to the car and got my medical bag and my books out, and then... <laughs> whoa, 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 why'd you do that? <laughs> it's, then, there's no logical reason. <laughs> wow. I needed my medical equipment, wow. and I needed my books. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. No, I mean, come on, common sense, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm alert, awake, and logical, I don't do that. You know, you know, I wasn't alert, awake, and logical. I'd just been in an accident. And then the cops come, and with the flashlight shining on the flashlight saying, oh, you look like you're drunk. I'm like, no, I'm not drunk. I said, but when you, uh, it's one o'clock in the morning now and you shine flashlights in my eyes. I said, I'm a medical doctor. I work at County USC. You can call over there. They did. And they, they dropped me off at a, a, a fast food restaurant. Then no, no help whatsoever. And I had to call one of my buddies up and say, hey, man, you got to come get me. I was in a car accident. You know, I just did 36 hours in a pediatric shift. And so that sleep deprivation, man, that is uh, brutal. And, and what happens is, too, you develop a time neurosis, all right? And um, all this neurotic stuff, not enough time, not enough time to prepare. I remember going through uh, surgery uh, rotation, right? And I, I remember uh, one of the best breast surgeons in the world, cancer surgeons, but it's especially was breast a resection, um, a reconstruction, all that kind of stuff he did. He was one of the best in the world, and I trained under him. Uh, during that time, the, my surgical work to rotation, he taught me a lot. But the thing is, I would always ask, I said, why are these women getting breast cancer? And his thing was, obviously, there's some genetic problem, and the genes are being affected, and they're going out of control. And when they go out of control, then, they, you know, we have to cut, burn, and, and, and chemicalize uh, them. Uh, and that, that never sat well with me. I'm like, mm, that doesn't quite make sense, but uh, i got to go along with it right now to want to get through this. But I remember uh, the entire, that was the summer. I remember the entire summer, I never, and this is the, this is God's truth, never saw the daylight. All right? I'm in the hospital. I'm up, I'm up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm in the hospital by 5. I'm making my own personal rounds between 5 and 6 with the patients I had to do that were either post-op or pre-op, means they've gotten out of surgery and they're, and they're convalescing or they're about to go into surgery that morning. All right? Uh, you had to do that before the attending got there, all right? Then you would make rounds again from six or seven, all right? Then you would scrub up, go do surgery, and then so you'd be in surgery, all right? Then you'd have to make your, your post-surgical rounds, and by the time you got out of the hospital, it was 11 o'clock, and then you had to go study what you had just done, all right? And make sure you did the right thing, and if there was something that come, came up that you didn't know about, you had to study that too. And like I said, it became, uh, you know, the sleep deprivation, the, the, the pressure, the anxiety, the worry, the fear, because uh, it was always a, a fear, you know, if you didn't do this perfectly, listen, either your uh, instructor, your attending was going to get on you, and if they didn't give you a, a positive report, you don't pass go. You're done. If you uh, if you did something to harm the patient, obviously, you know, that's traumatic in and of itself. And of course, when you're a rookie, the chance of harming somebody is high if, if you don't know what the hell you're doing. All right? And so, you know, she, uh, listen, the nurses saved me there because I'd always be asking the nurses, uh, what are you supposed to do in this situation? Mm. Uh, what do you do here? And, you know, they would uh, they, they'd laugh at first. But I, I, I remember the guy came in, um, overweight guy, obese guy, came in the uh, county USC emergency room. And I had a nickname for the emergency room, which escapes me right now. But it was, uh, uh, that was a probably one of the busiest emergencies room in all of uh, L.A. County. And gunshot wounds, gang warfare, all the nonsense going on. Uh, but this guy came in um, with a uh, with a, with a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, as we call it. And I'm in the back room trying to get some sleep 
because I've been up all day, all right, and now it's my time to do night call, all right. Uh, you always, you never get sleep, though. No. You're in, you're you're in the, the cot in the in the back behind the nurses station, uh, and I had like seven or eight beds for the doctors that were on call. But there's always somebody's beeper going off. I remember the, the at that time there were no cell phones, and this was in the 80s. There were no cell phones, so your beepers going off. Someone's knocking on the door. Doctor, this and that. Uh, we need orders for this one. So finally, they got me and said, Yeah, you have a motor cardio infarction patient, so I got to go up. Um, I got to assess the patient, examine the patient. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, by the time I get through the exam, it's now 3 o'clock in the morning. I write up some orders. In the middle of writing up some orders, and I'm writing up morphine for the pain, and you, you want to um, uh, loosen up the uh, pulmonary vessels. Morphine helps with that, so you have less, uh, the, the heart has less to, uh, uh, pressure to uh, pump against. And I remember just passing out. Boom. Now, I passed out, but I was still conscious. I could hear everything that was going on. My body wouldn't allow me to sleep uh, 100%, especially with this guy's life on the line. But there, there was just no more energy left. It was just, go, I boom, out. And I can remember, I can hear the nurses laughing and giggling. There's another one. I mean, I wasn't the first. Mm. <laughs> it was a long line. So, just, okay, so why, why were they laughing at you exactly? Because they watch all these young doctors come through. I mean, they've been nurses for 20, 30 years. I mean, they're old. They've done it all, seen it all. Uh, actually, they probably have more knowledge uh, as far as direct patient care than the, than the young doctors did. So it was funny to them to watch us, you know, just kind of boom. And then they were, you know, I, they, they probably gave me about 10 to 15 minutes. Doctor, you got to wake up and finish writing these orders. Wow. Oh, shit. I'm like, man, I got this guy's life in my hand. I can't think clearly. And I got to write orders for a myocardial infarction guy who just, uh, you know, is dying of a heart attack. You know, and ultimately I was able to pull it together enough to, to write it and go back to sleep and uh, get back up and then make rounds again of the whole thing, you know. And, my, you know, I mean, listen, if you're getting sleep deprivation, light deprivation, you never see the sun. Uh, for an entire summer. I mean, this is uh, this is not um, it's not necessary. Uh, it's brutal. Uh, it's traumatic, and almost everybody that comes out of there has some sort of post-traumatic stress disorder, neurosis. Uh, the thing about it is, are you, do you wake up enough quick, quickly enough to realize that you've got this thing, and are you and now are you going to do something about it? Most don't. The doctors. The second thing I asked them when we were in the um, hospital the other day, I'm like, okay, how about something as simple as. Uh, uh, peptic acid disorder. You guys call it esophageal reflux disorder because there's always a name that you come up with in medicine, and then for, therefore there's new medication that you can give for something basic we call heartburn. I said, what, what, what is the reason for the heartburn? Well, it's too much acid, Dr. Mahoney. It's too much acid going back up into the uh, esophagus. I said, too much acid. I said, let me show you the recent research, okay, that's been available actually for 10 years, so it's not so recent. The reason for heartburn is actually the opposite of what you're telling me. It is actually low acidity. But remember, any acid refluxing back up into the esophagus is going to burn, high or low. It doesn't matter. Acid is acid. It burns. It's corrosive. I said, do you realize the problem is low acidity because the cells that are supposed to be making the proper amounts of uh, hydrochloric acid aren't functioning anymore for whatever reason, likely because of the standard American diet for many, many years and being overweight uh, because that pulls open a valve, too, that allows acid to reflux um, uh, in, into the esophagus. So I said, do you, do you realize that what you're doing by giving antacids, all right, your Pepsids, your Protonics, your Zantax, uh, the so forth and so on. There's so many of them out there now, over the counter and acids. I said it is actually doing more harm than good, and you will not cure anybody. Well, how do you cure them? I said, well, we would start with number one, changing the diet. Number two, Bragg's uh, apple cider vinegar, a couple of tablespoons a day, some probiotics, digestive enzymes and make sure that the patient is also taking a fiber supplement because most of them weren't about to change their diet. So you give them a fiber supplement to keep things going. All right, you give that digestive tract a chance to rest. The cells will start to regenerate. All right, um, but um, you know, good luck in trying to change uh, people whose minds are not there. It's hard for them to, to change their diets. You know, now what I've started doing with the doctors is, you know, uh, call them out. I said, first of all, we are the most unhealthy group especially mentally. When you look at the, the numbers, uh, you can do a Google search, start page search, whatever, and just look at uh, the uh, statistics, the health of physicians versus the general population. And, you know, I expected to get a whole lot of information on just physical health, um, heart, heart, heart rate attacks, obesity issues, uh, 
cancer issues, so forth and so on. Uh, what I got was, amazingly, was more of the mental problems that physicians deal with. So we have a much higher rate of mental disorder, right? So we have, you know, folks that have mental issues, right, who don't know they have mental issues, right? Uh, we had a guy, um, this was uh, within the last year, got a divorce, got into a car accident, Still was working, and then ultimately got into a depressed state and shot himself with a gun. When doctors go out to commit suicide, they're usually successful. They're 90% successful uh, compared to the general population, which is about 30 to 40% successful. Mm. Most of the population does not commit, even when they try to commit suicide, they're not successful. Doctors are very successful. They know how to kill themselves. Wow. Uh, uh, yes. So the rate, uh, the, really the stuff that was uh, out there was the stuff on the mental issues, uh, which doesn't surprise me, but of course, if you, under, if you have mental issues, if you have mental imbalance, if you're dealing with fear and neurosis, uh, and most of us have time neurosis, I had to deal with that for a long time, and every once in a while, it creeps back in. Okay, what's that exactly, time neurosis? Time neurosis, where you feel like you just don't have enough time to do it. Hmm. You don't have enough time. You know, you don't have enough time to make rounds. You don't have enough time to save this person's life. You got other people who you got to get to. You know, you don't have enough time to study. And so time becomes, listen, I mean, there, 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 there were people, and I was in it, where even going to the bathroom became like, I don't think I can take a bathroom break right now, much less eat. Forget about eating. And so you're living the most unhealthy lifestyle that you can live while you're going through this stuff, mm. and you're at the most stressful, so you're getting toxins from everywhere, right? I mean, listen, brushing your teeth is like, and that's a luxury. Wow. <laughs> you know? wow. I mean, when you're going through internship and residency, you know, it is. Uh, luckily now, by time I got into, I finished my internship, I went to my residency, and as you start to get higher up the, the ladder in residency, that's your specialty training, it becomes a little less traumatic, right? But you're still dealing with, you know, you still have a lot of responsibilities. You're still essentially a young physician. Now you've got, uh, you're, now you're running entire units. I remember my attending said, well, here you go. Uh, you, you're, you're in charge. You're the chief resident now. I'll, uh, call me if you need me. And all of a sudden, I'm in charge of this uh, neuropsychiatric unit. I'm like, I'm in charge? <laughs> hmm. I said, I better, I, better get, I better get with the program here, you know. So, I, you know, you figure out ways of surviving. You figure out ways of, uh, you know, um, when you get to that level, you've, you've, you've got enough, at least enough experience to not do any harm to people. And see, you know, when you're a physician, I mean, you take the Hippocratic Oath, and that now I'm finding out um, you don't even take it anymore. But, you know, the, the main part of the Hippocratic Oath is designed so that you, you first do no harm uh, to the patient. And I can't see how, you know, treating cancer, which we know is a toxic disorder, with corrosive chemicals, you know that if you have, um, if you spill the chemotherapy onto your skin, it will burn you, right? And what we're putting into people's bodies. I'm like, how the hell is that going to work, mm. right? There's only one way that works, right? And most of the time it doesn't work, but sometimes it does work. And how does it work? It works because the people believe in it so much because their mind and their faith is so entrenched into that that it actually works. It ain't the, it ain't the chemotherapy, it ain't the drugs, it ain't the surgery. It is the belief and the faith in that system that actually. So when people come to me with cancer, I'm like, okay, and they believe in chemotherapy. I can't tell them, and, they, and, they, and they're so committed to it. The likelihood is that their own minds will cure them. You know, I, 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 I say, hey, well, during this time, you may want to take the toxic load off, and this is how you can mitigate some of the things. But for the most part, their own minds cure them. It's the faith. So if someone is that connected to that type of system, which makes no logic sense once, you, once you've uh, studied medicine and you study the healing arts and you study naturopathic medicine and you put it all together, you're like, that makes no damn sense. Mm. How the hell does that work? You know, you know, I had a knee injury um, uh this was a year and a half, two years ago, playing basketball. And they said, well, you're going to need an MRI. And I'm like, Christ, okay, let me look up the, the radiation exposure for MRI. I'm like, hey, just one MRI can cause cancer. Mm. That's how much radiation. But I had to go through because it the only way they could diagnose it. I'm like, hey, I can't get back on the basketball court unless I know what it is. And this is the only way to diagnose it. So I went through it. One hour of radiation exposure or 45 minutes is how long it took to get that uh, uh, MRI done, right? And now you have people that come in with uh, brain surgery 
right? You have to do MRIs uh, and CT scans to diagnose the, 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 the brain tumors. By the way, brain tumors are now accelerating, especially in the youth of today. Anybody got an idea why that would be? Well, it's very simple. What are people putting to their heads these days that we didn't have 20 years ago? That will be called your enemy, the cell phone. Mm. And this story, listen, I have one sitting next to me right now. It's on silent mode. But um, you can't um, uh, I'll be putting this stuff up to, up to your face, up to your head, and expect that it's not going to have some toxic consequence. It has negative consequences. Yes, it does cause brain tumors. They'll, they'll, they'll tell you, well, we don't have definitive research. I said, yeah, I got the definitive research. I'm already looking at the research and also looking at common sense. I, this stuff is, a, is basically a microwave that you're holding to your brain, and you're cooking your brain. You're, de, you're denaturing uh, proteins and cells. You're hitting things at a, at, a, at, a, at a genetic level, and of course, it's causing cancer. So now, so I just had a lady um, who was the department chairman where uh, one of the hospitals work. His wife had, had, had cancer. I said, "What side are you listening to the cell phone on? The right side." I said, "Okay, listen, uh, you got a choice." Um, well, we, we all went out to dinner together. I said, "You can start with." Really, a detox program, fruits, vegetables, water, nothing else. All right? I say, even if you decide to do the chemo, do this as well because you got to get the, get the chemo out. And the doctor, who was her husband, said, no, we, that's crazy. What, what, what are you talking about? You're going you're gonna to kill my wife. And the, the wife actually wanted to do that program because uh, intuitively she knew I was talking the truth. I said, yeah, you, and you know, that's the side. She had a parotid gland tumor that ended up in her brain. Then it became metastatic. What do they do? More x-rays, more MRIs, more CT scan, and more radiation, making the cancer even worse and more malignant. I remember going up into the hospital I work at and watching her uh, on a morphine drip, and three days after that, she was gone. And I'm like, okay, this is modern medicine. Mm. Uh, it's ridiculous. There was really no reason. I, I'm not saying, see, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that I could have saved her because I can't save anybody. I, right at this point in time, I teach you how to save yourself. I, uh, when you come when you come to me, I tell you, hey, listen, you've got to take 100% responsibility for your own health. Not the doctor, not the healer, not the natural path. Doesn't matter who the hell it is. Not the authority figure. It don't matter. You must become the authority figure. You must take 100% responsibility for your own health. You must do the research. I can guide you. I can train you. I can tell you what works and what doesn't work based on my experience. All right? I can tell you what I would do, but ultimately, guess who has to make the decision? You do. And if you don't have any knowledge going into that noggin, all right, uh, and you keep your brain uh, uh, ignorant, all right, and you keep your mind ignorant, uh, then you're going you're gonna to end up with uh, serious problems, you know. 95% of what I do right now is education with the patients that I'm, I'm working with. I mean, hey, you must um, become the um, the healer. The healing force is with inside of you, all right? Uh, your your ability to connect to Mother Nature and fall in love with Mother Nature, all right? And fall in love and, and be in harmony with the source of all, that's, that's within you, all right? Uh, you've got to understand how, how to do it. You've got to understand who you are. Again, you've got to wake up from your nightmare. You've got to wake up from the the crisis. You know, and uh, good luck if you go if you go into doctors who are not themselves awakening. Now, the good news is I'm I'm starting up a, a program, of working with doctors to get them to change at least some of their viewpoints on how things get done. With simple things like I like I just showed you about the, the acid. I said no, no, it's, you don't get acid. Uh, you don't uh, you know uh, uh, pain medicine. So you get these non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory medications for joint pain. All right, when we know that you can rebuild the joint with the with the proper nutrition and proper food, all right, losing weight, of course, if you're overweight, uh, uh, so you take the, the stress off the joint. So I said, but uh, you give pain medications. We know now that the pain medications themselves are leading to heart disease. Uh, there have been a lot of lawsuits to that, and that they destroy the joint space in the long, in the long run, all right? Well, the next time we get together, uh, I'll, I'll be talking about neuropsychiatry, the state of neuropsychiatry. Uh, really, my specialty now is getting people off uh, psychotropic medication. Oh, yes. I mean, you, you're coming to me, you know, uh, with a major depressive episode that is self, that will self-resolve in itself even without treatment in nine months to a year, all right, even without treatment. But now you're coming to me on all these uh, SSRIs and all these different uh, antidepressant medications um, that have uh, a burning 
uh, just like uh, post-traumatic stress, just like the doctors. There's a this time neurosis that I talked about. This uh, post-traumatic stress it burns into the brain, actually changes some of the neurochemistry of the brain. It changes some of the neural connections of the brain. Believe it or not. So, but well, do you do you think that 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 change? Because now we're getting into to the impact that it has on on doctors' ability to think. You know, just mm-hmm. in terms of even on a humanistic level to be able to connect to other human beings. Do you think that that has an impact on uh, doctors uh, sense of ethics? So, in other words, is it possible that all of the d- different degrees of stress programming uh, trauma influences a doctor's ability to just connect with people in humanistic ways? And, and when they if they were able to connect with people in humanistic ways, maybe they wouldn't do some of the things that they do, like putting, you know, for instance, you gave reference to, uh, you know, people who have cancer uh, and there's a cancer treatment, but the cancer treatment is really just burning them up on the inside right uh and, and yet these things are done or something like cesarean se- uh, sections these types of things do you think that this has an impact of trauma oh, without a doubt 100 percent. i mean listen uh when i was making uh some notes for the show a couple weeks ago um uh, one of the things I, I i and i saw it in myself too uh which is kind of scary is this uh, desensitization because you've been desensitized to death You've been desensitized to a, a, a patient suffering pain. You, listen, if you internalize it, you'll go nuts. Mm. Because it's found it all day long, right? So you get desensitized to it. I remember um, my daughter was born, and my wife was complaining about me. She goes, uh, you don't care about me. I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> and so we got into an argument at the, at the doctor's. She wanted to go have the baby in a natural birthing center. And I said, but, yeah, you, you're at 40-something years old. It's a high I said, I would normally do that if you were in your 20s or 30s. No promise. In forties, we, you know, we 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 at that time where you know things uh, go up, go wrong exponentially. So we can do it in the hospital, but we try and do it as natural as possible. So I end up. Um, she's you know in pain. She's suffering. You know, I come and comfort her to somewhat, but to me it wasn't a big deal. Why? Because I delivered over three hundred babies. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Not a big deal. It should have been a big deal. I should have been emotionally connected. I wasn't. Wow. I was to the whole thing. I actually helped deliver my baby. I was the first one to touch my baby and uh, uh, look at her head, look at her eyes wide open. She was healthy. Thank God we, you know, uh, uh, the wife was on the queen's diet for the most part. She had some meat, but she was pretty pretty clean when um, uh, we had the baby. So the baby, uh, you know, came out very healthy. She'd be five in um, May 20th. And I'm happy to say that she'd never been vaccinated. Of course, <laughs> the, the scary thing was I'm a medical doctor. There's another medical doctor there. And he's going to tell me that she needs a hepatitis vaccine. I said, you lost your freaking mind. Mm. I said, for what reason would an undeveloped baby uh, who has no immune system to speak of at this point, right, other than that's what that's going to get conferred by the mother's breast milk, mm-hmm. right? That's how the babies get immunity until they... Colos- colostrum? They, mm-hmm. Yes. So that's, their, that's, their, that's how they fight off diseases with mother's breast milk. I said, you're going to tell me you're going to inject her in the first hours of life with a hepatitis vaccine? I, psh, don't make me hurt you, but my friend. You better step on out of here. Mm. I said, not only that, because the wife took no pain medications and she wouldn't even get a piece out of me or anything like that. I said, okay, let's wait 24 hours before we go. And as soon as that 24 hours was up, we had to find out AMA. I was a doctor. I was, AMA means against medical advice. They didn't want us to go. No, they want to keep us two, three days, four days. I'm like, hey. Doc, I'm sorry, but you know what I'm talking about. Hospital is no place for me. All my, all my wife, all my baby right now. It's just not going to happen. We're out of here. All right? He left in, in, uh, after 24 hours. Baby's fine. What, I mean, you know, it's like, what, what do you mean she's got to stay three days? It doesn't make no damn sense. Mm. Three days for what? Three days in a, in a hospital with, uh, surrounded by sickness and disease? All right? You guys, God knows, you know. They ended up t- taking a blood sample for her, where I didn't even know they did that for vitamin K. Uh, now we find out that they're sending all this blood to the uh, to uh, these blood banks, uh, getting everybody's uh, uh, genotype. So mm-hmm. that, and that's a whole that's a whole other thing. Right? I mean, the thing, the whole thing about nanotechnology, the vaccination, that's a whole other show of uh, discussion. And we probably should probably try and find an expert on that too, because that would be very very interesting. Um, because this is it is the new area of of, of toxicity. But again. It, it, we can't run around afraid. We just have to be educated, knowledgeable, and then take the uh, uh, appropriate course of action that's within our power to do so. And that's all we can do. All right. What happens after that is, you know, hey, uh, that's uh, that's up to the powers that be in the, uh, uh, the universal consciousness that, that that governs everything. But you know, all we can do is uh, utilize our, our creative intelligence uh, and do the best we can. But if we sit around and do nothing, 
pretend like nothing is happening, then we've got a big problem, right? When, uh, when, when we know that uh, corn now is genetically modified, it's not made for the human body. Uh, I just did a study on uh, genetically modified corn where they were putting uh, the genes of toxins into the corn. So the torn, corn will make a toxin. Right? The toxin would then kill off any of the insects or natural predators for the corn. So the corn crop, the, the, the corn crop yield was a higher percentage, right? Then we eat the corn. And a funny thing happened. They started finding out that the normal gut flora, that's the normal good bacteria in, in your body, and everybody has about, an average size man has anywhere between two and three pounds, pounds of bacteria in their, in their gut, in their, mostly in the colon. Right? Uh, this is natural, right? We're living in a symbiotic relationship with good bacteria. Right? They produce compounds that we need. They produce vitamins that we need. So keeping those, that flora in as good a shape as it can and not killing it off with antibiotics and all the other crap that we use. Obviously, eating the meat kills it off because it has the antibiotics and it's also uh, a dead food. And it's also very dynamic. See, the bacteria is dynamic. It's moving. It's, it's, it's always in a state of flux and change depending on what you do to to it, what you add to it, what you don't. And so uh, when you eat this genetically modified corn, uh, most of it gets excreted, except the genetic particles that are now uh, were in the corn now become free to get incorporated into the bacteria. Mm. Bacteria are simple. Now the bacteria start to synthesize the same damn toxin. And so now you're dealing with your gut flora infected with genetically modified corn, right? And people say, well, I eat, I eat organic corn. I said, listen, there's no such thing as organic corn. You may buy it in the store and it may say organic corn, but guess what? When Farmer John down the street, who ain't organic, right, like most of us, is dealing with, you know, uh, Farmer A, that, that, who is organic, there is always cross pollination. There is no, there's, the nature is not in the vacuum. So if if the majority, if, if we reach 95 percent of corn that's GMO, which we have, that means all of it is GMO, even if you have organic practices, right? So it's all GMO now, right? So we've ruined the corn crop, right? So nobody should be eating corn, all right? Um, so corn and soy, you know, are out. Um, obviously, we shouldn't be eating any artificial sweeteners either. And then the, the list is about six or seven things that we should never, ever do, and we'll get into that in another show. So this is what's happening. So you have, you know, your own body is now poisoning you, right? And this is modern technology, and, and, and yet the doctors, you know, they have tunnel vision, and this is what the problem is. Because you, uh, uh, listen, the pharmaceutical companies rule medical training, all right? So you're going to get trained and tra traumatized, and the odds of you thinking outside of the box are few and far between, all right? It's just very rare. You know, my father got sick um, a couple years ago, um, and I told uh, my mother, I said, go just go find an MD, ND uh, in that area and, and let, let him work with them, and he'd probably get, be able to uh, get, get him back to 100% uh, health and, 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 and probably even working again. So I get a call back in a, a couple weeks, uh, son. Uh, there is no MD, ND. I said, not, not one? Not one. I said, okay, are there any just naturopaths out there? You couldn't find one. Mm. They a nutritionist, so they went to nutritionist, but he wouldn't work the damn either. You know, I'm talking to uh, Forrest, which is the Hootie Mahatra. You know, I'm I'm, right, I'm I'm not too far from the Hootie's uh, store, the um, the the the, uh, the health store. So I'm talking to Forrest Patrick about you know some of the stuff that's going on. You know that I need I need some help. With, you know if I'm going to take this to the next level, and he goes, um, okay. Um, uh, I'll be I'll be willing to help you out. Tell me a little about about what's going on with you. And so I gave him the 60 minutes VO2, and after that he goes one billion. I said, what? He goes, you, you, you don't know who you are. He said, there's nobody out there like you. I said, there are no MDs and D's out here. He said, I looked as we're talking on the phone. I'm on the I went on the internet looking in Southern California to see if we can find somebody that maybe you can join forces with. He said, there's nobody. Mm. <laughs> and I said, that's I said, are you kidding? You got to be kidding! I'm just thinking that this is just, just normal. The doctors are now thinking outside the box. There's enough information out there. Uh, uh, enough people are be becoming spiritually awake or conscious about what's going on. There's enough information out there. There's a raw food. There's all this stuff that's out there now. It's easy to get the information, and yet find one that's willing to come on and say what I'm saying. You may find three in the entire United States. That's what I've been able to locate. Mm. 
three. That I, and, and out of those three, I, you know, most of them are still, you know, uh, okay, you got a problem, here's a herb for the problem. And it's still, it's still, it's, it's, it's the same, you know, the alternative medicine, you have to be careful. I mean, you got to be careful when you get, uh, where you get your herbs from. I mean, are your herbs sprayed? How, how do you know your herbs are not sprayed? Where are the herbs coming from? How fresh are the herbs, right? Uh, uh, you know, if you eat fresh fruit, you pretty much can tell whether or not it's fresh or not. Herbs are different because they're dried, all right? Um, some of them sit on the shelf for years. They, 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 they lose their potency over time like most things do. Uh, so you have to know. You have to, you have to develop a relationship with a company that's doing it the right way, all right? Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, as far as the tummy goes, no, he uh, he goes. You got to continue to write your book. You got to continue to uh, uh, get this message out. He goes. He says you're unique, and there's nobody out there like you. And I said, Oh my God, <laughs> that's that's scary and sad. But you know, obviously it's an opportunity for me. But I said, Man, this is a big mantle for me to carry because I mean, there's nobody out there like that. Uh, you know, I mean, we're talking Southern California. Mm. We're talking about you know, with people are open-minded and blah 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 blah. blah. No, they couldn't find it. They couldn't find it in New York. That's where my folks are. They couldn't find it in New York. I'm like, come on. You got to be able to find it. No. So this is why, you know, education becomes so important. Uh, formal or uh, uh, otherwise, you got to educate yourself. You got to get some knowledge into that noggin. Uh, you folks, we got to wake up. We got to start taking control of our own lives back again. We can't live under fear anymore. Uh, we've got you've, you've got to use rational, uh, critical thinking, and you can't do that when 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 it's fear. Me and Lyndon were talking when we first talked. He goes, "Well, do you want to go anonymous, Doc?" I'm like, "I ain't got to go anonymous." I said, "Nobody cares what I have to say right now." <laughs> and I, I said, "You know, I did, 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 you know, what, how many people follow me?" Uh, couple hundred uh patients i said uh, i said now if i wrote a book and 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 a, and a hundred thousand people were following me or a couple million people were following me yeah they'd be very concerned the system would be very concerned they're not very concerned i said i said i would like to have that problem by the way <laughs> <laughs> well we probably gonna get there but you know i, I want to do this because we're just about out of time and, and i, I want to make sure i want to let everyone know that we're going to do a series of shows so as you can tell uh, you know oh, yeah, there's a lot to cover yeah, and i'm, I'm jumping yeah, around from here and there that's okay to... that's okay because the chat room is packed and, and we have already received a whole lot of questions. We won't have time to answer questions today. So everyone who sent in questions, what I w would like for you to do is just hold on to the next interview, which will be next month. Okay. And, and I'll have all that information up there. But anyone who's in the chat room now, if you have any questions that you would like for Dr. Z to answer in, in the next show, click on my name, Lennon Honor, in the chat room and send me a private message. Another way that you can do it is you can just email me. You can send me an email to Lennon at LennonHonor.com or you can, uh, you know, on Facebook, you can send me your question for the next show. Okay. So anyone, if you have any questions, Questions. We'll get to your questions uh, next month uh, in the next radio interview. But one of the things uh, I, I want to, to kind of close out here, uh, Dr. Z, because there's, there's quite a few things that I've kind of pinpointed that I, I think, you know, we should at, at some point, maybe we'll get started with this in the next interview. We should talk about it. And let me just give a quick list. And then I, I have um, something that I would like for you just to address before we close out the show. Okay. Uh, okay. One is the financial pressure that um, doctors experience. Um, I have a, a doctor friend in, in San Diego, uh, and I remember she was already in her 40s and uh, probably mid 40s, and she still had about two hundred thousand uh, dollars in student loans. Let me address the financial part of that, because that's a, a huge part, because remember, uh, the more time and money you, you invest in something, the less likely you can afford to fail at it. Right? Oh. So regardless of what it is, uh, especially um, especially in medicine, the um, the good news when I was going through training, um, uh, school wasn't nearly as expensive as it is now, so I, I, I probably did everything, undergrad, medical school training for about 50 grand, and it took me about seven, eight years to pay it off before I was completely paid off mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. at a 9% interest. Uh, we fast forward to today. Uh, we go to back to Washington, D.C., where I train, where you have Georgetown University, Howard University, uh, there's the Catholic University, American University, uh, GW University, all of those universities are there. John Hopkins is right down the street, uh, not too far from it. University of Maryland is right there. And we go there and we look at the average cost of a medical education. Uh, it is completely off the hook. Uh, you will not be able to complete a medical school education uh, for uh, right around, it's going to be somewhere between 150 and 200,000. Right? And you, that means you must go into debt unless you're rich. All right? uh, now, the financial pressures to pay that off, and you get it's always at a high in interest rate, and actually, that's a whole other story, but they're actually hoping that you default on it. 
uh, because then they can they, they, they do some things. Usually when you're uh, uh, signing those loans, you have to have a co-signer because you're not working, you're going to school. And so those co-signers don't realize they're on the line. They actually put their, they actually, their, their houses are on the line when they don't pay. And, uh, you know, I was just talking to a financial guy, and they're like, yeah, we, 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 we're kind of hoping that they don't pay so we can go after and take all the houses and stuff. Uh, we, we're, we're anticipating a, a good number of them will not be able to pay back. Uh, but the, the doctors usually can find a job and usually get get enough traction where they can start making payments. But yeah, the financial pressures become tremendous uh, given the fact that um, uh, physician salaries are not going up; they're going down. So you now have to increase your volume in order to make the same amount that you were making um, five years ago. You almost have to increase it by 33 percent. Well, how are you going to uh, treat somebody? When you can only spend 10, 15 minutes, if they, if they spend 15 minutes with you, you go, you, you got a good doctor. <laughs> Let me tell you, all right. Symptom, here's your pill. Next, symptom, here's your pill. Next, symptom, you know. Come on, man. The system is ridiculous, but they have to do that in order to be able to make the money, just to pay your ex- expenses, to live comfortably, and to pay the um, and to pay the loan off. Mm. Yeah. Med- so med- medical school now is, is becoming um, increasingly more, uh, more and more for only the rich. Right, mm. and the average guy, you know, he, he's not he, he's going to be exed out, and we we're seeing this in, in a number of areas. But of course, in medical training, man, when it's two hundred thousand just to get to school, that don't include your books, that don't include room and board. That's just the tuition to the school, right? So it's two hundred thousand plus, right? Uh, and, and the blood, sweat, and tears that go into it, and the state of mind that you come out. Now, I will say one thing. As I did my uh, research, it looks like the um, schools have gotten the message about this marathon race, about the brutality that goes on in the schools, and they're starting to at least listen a little bit and, and, and make things a little bit more uh, tenable for the uh, student that's going through this stuff, right? You know, a natural path, a dentist, uh, anybody else in any other healthcare nurse, none of them have to go through this type of training that the doctors go through. It is unnecessary. It is dangerous. It is not healthy mentally or physically or any other way to be training physicians in the way that they get trained. All right, that nonsense has to stop. All right, uh, physicians themselves have to wake up because we're the only ones that can stop it. Uh, that's why I'm trying to put together programs right now. I've got some connections in Hawaii, Florida, New York. I'm trying to, um, really what I'm doing now is the doctors who are sick are coming to me and asking for help. You know, I'm 90 pounds old, weigh high blood pressure, this and that, and nothing's working. So what do you, and I heard you talking to your other patients, blah, blah, blah. What do you think will work? I'm like, if this, if what I tell you works, you will then put it into practice and then you will go get certified as a detox specialist somewhere, somehow, and start your path on naturopathic, naturopathic medicine. Is that a deal? Yes. I get them well, and they and and then and now 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 they're believers. But you know that's only one at a time. I got to figure out a way to affect people on a on, on a much uh, doctors on a much bigger level. They have to wake up. They have to stop having tunnel vision. They have to understand what the Hippocratic oath was about. And like I said, now I think most of the doctors that are graduating don't even take the Hipp- Hippocratic oath, uh, which is do no harm, right? And doctors, you know, the other the, the other, other tenet is doctor heal yourself. We cannot have the sick. Uh, uh, treating the sick, we cannot have the blind leading the blind. It's uh, insane, and this is the system that we find ourselves under. This is the um, uh, uh, insanity of it, and you know everybody suffers. You know the doctors suffer, the patients suffer, and I, I would say most doctors are well intentioned. They have good hearts. Uh, they want to try and do the right thing, uh, but you know they're in their own sleep, they're on their own hypnotic tunnel vision, and they refuse to wake up, and therefore they become dangerous. It was like. Um, um, the Matrix, where um, Lawrence Fishburne as Neo is talking to, uh, excuse me, as Morpheus is talking to Neo about why they don't wake people up out of the Matrix. And he goes, Once you go into the Matrix, these people are dangerous. All right, because until they wake up, they form, they, they, they all are potential enemies. Now, listen, we don't need to get paranoid, but the concept is, yeah, until the doctors wake up, they 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 are potentially doing more harm than good. All right, even though their intention is good. Mm. Right. And uh, uh, again, we cannot have this, this, this system of uh, symptom, drug, symptom, drug, symptom, drug, symptom, drug. It doesn't work. Yes, you can do that 
temporarily if you want to do that and provide some temporary relief, but you've got to go a lot deeper than that, folks. I mean, the, and the doctors have the capacity to do it. They, can, they understand the physiology, the biochemistry. Uh, it wouldn't take them long to, to, to just wake up and go to the next level, but they stop. And see, I never stopped, and I have not stopped now, and I'm continuing to grow as a healer, all right? Uh, it, it, the process will never end, all right? And like I said, that's why there's no such thing as a master healer, because that would imply that you've already got it down, you've already mastered it, and there's nothing more to master. Uh, uh-uh. There's always something new. There's always something different. There's always another concept that can be brought in on a naturopathic tip, on a metaphysical tip to get you healthy and get you well and get you reestablished back with Mother Nature again. And like I say, I hope it happens quickly enough so that Mother Nature doesn't shrug us all off this planet because that's what's going to happen if we continue down this path. Uh, she's not going to tolerate it, all right? And this is, this is everybody. We all have to uh, wake up. And, you know, this program, uh, the work that you're doing, uh, the work that I'm doing, you know, it's all designed really ultimately to educate and wake, wake folks up, right? And we cannot be, uh, be functioning from a point of, of view of fear. You know, when you got $200,000 plus uh, to pay off, man, you're going to be in a state of fear. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're going to be desensitized. All right? You're going to be depressed. All right, you're going to be anxious, and you're going to be worried, uh, you're going to be fearful, you're going to be toxic, all right? And again, we, got, we have the unhealthy treating, uh, tr- tr- treating the unhealthy, the blind treating the blind. It does not work. It's not good. I mean, they've got to understand the deeper issues of healing, and it, it's been around for thousands and thousands of years. The information is readily available, but you just got to wake up and come and wake up from when you sleep and you slumber, get out of the, 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 t- the tunnel vision and wake up and see they won't wake up. And uh, right now, the only ones that are waking up are the ones who suffer, and that I'm able to help and then and then and now they now they get it oh i now now you get it okay but what was stopping you from why did you stop growing as a healer all right medical school internship residency specialization all that stuff that should just be steps along the way you don't stop you know but most of the most of them stop families they have big houses now they have mortgages to pay uh, a, lot, a lot of them you know they put their um uh, out their career before the wife and that creates problems so there's a high rate of divorce and and, and dysfunction and it just goes on and on and on it, it has to change and I'm, I'm hoping that it will i'm going to do my part i know that you letting me on the show this, this evening was um you know one one, one step and part of that mission but see i know what my mission is i'm very clear about what that mission is and i will not stop uh ever you know, I will not stop learning. I will stop not not. I will not never stop learning to be a healing student. I'll always remain uh, humble. I'll never lose the sensitivity with the patients. Man, I always I'll talk to the other patients uh, doctors who because their doctors won't talk to them. They come to me. They're like, they're, they're, they're like, well, we heard what you were telling this other patient, so I got four or five people. What was that recipe? What was that thing? How do you lose weight? You know, and it's like, you know, sh- uh, you know, I had ten people around me the other day uh, trying to get information out of me. Uh, you know, you can't save everybody, but I mean, it's just uh, interesting that even the patients themselves know instinctively, man, it's not working, man. We got to, we, there's got to be another way, and there is, and uh, a lot of us are aware of what that other way is, but a lot of us are not, and uh, unfortunately, um, doctors are, uh, as a whole remain in a state of ignorance, intelligent ignorance, but ignorance nonetheless, and they have to begin the process of waking up. Um, uh, and some are, I would say, you know, just like the general population, uh, more and more of us are waking up and uh, more and more of the doctors will wake up too. But because of the, the power that they have and because of the um, uh, positions that they're in to sway people's opinions and, and, and how they manage uh, illness and treat disease. And, and remember, the, the system is really about disease management, not disease treatment and not cure for sure, but they don't even see it. A lot of them don't see it. I mean, because they've been so programmed, like I said, through the trauma, through the fear-based mind control, they stay, and it's just, it's just interesting to watch how they just stay in that mindset and can't break out of it. And it's like they're hypnotized and half asleep. And it's just it's very frustrating at the, at the end of the spectrum. There are those that are waking up, uh, like myself. Um, like I said, I never bought into it 100% because I've been to the mystery schools and metaphysical schools. So I already kind of knew it was more to it than what they were teaching. And I, and I didn't go in to become a medical doctor. I went in really to become a master healer. And now I realize all I was going to become was a master student of the healing arts. And that's where I am today. And I'm still getting information. As I get information, I will share it with my patients, share it with the audience, share it with uh, whoever 
never once listen. Uh, but again, their state of mind is the thing that counts. If your mind is not will- willing to accept it and receive it or put it into practice, and you've got to have some discipline, folks. I mean, you know, you got to have a little bit of self-discipline, and it works. And it works wonderfully, and it works at the deepest levels. And you know, uh, you know, when you when you start to embrace Mother Nature, and you start to understand that there is a spiritual connection, a mind awakening connection between your diet and your consciousness, and your intuition, and your self awareness, uh, and you see this these energy centers start to open up. You know, it's a wonderful thing. So it's out there. The information is out there. It's readily available. It has been for quite some time. But like I said, the system man, they they they're very very good at taking that mind, that young mind, and molding it so that it stays stuck in that system, all right, where it should not, it should continue to grow. And so we're seeing stunted growth and mental growth and, you know, uh, a high, and because of that, a high level of mental illness. I mean, like neuropsychiatrists, we're like, what, number two on the suicide list? Hmm. Why is that? You know, but because you don't know how, number one, what you're doing is not working. Number two, you're, you're, you're picking up on all that negative energy and you don't have any idea of how to, first of all, not to pick it up in the first place, but when you do have it, what do you do with it? All right. Uh, the, 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 that's never taught to you. Mm. Right. The whole, the whole, the whole science of energetics and frequencies is not taught to you. All right. Uh, uh, the whole idea about light. I, I mean, I, mean I, you know, I was talking to the doctor the other day. I said, you know, ultimately when nutrition is burned, what does it turn into ultimately when the cell is actually utilizing it? It turns into fire or light. Yes, it is sparked up. Uh, so it starts as light, it ends as light. That's why I said all healing begins and ends with light. Uh, because even at the cellular level, when that final bit of fuel is used, it is a, a light reaction when it's all said and done. So it's the power of that light reaction that uh, really governs everything, how healthy we're going to be, uh, what frequency we're vibrating at, um, how we... Um, how our consciousness responds to things, uh, empathy uh, towards others, getting in touch with whatever your soul mission is supposed to be, having a dream, pursuing the dream, all these things is all interrelated and all, and, and all tied in together. So like you say, it's, it's the, you have to come out of the fear-based mind control and you have to, uh, we have to awaken. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes we have to do it one person at a time. We'd like, we'd like the whole world to wake up, but, uh, you know, the way the system is set up, that's not likely to happen. But one at a time is good enough. We do what you can. Uh, and so, you know, as a group here, uh, your listening audience, we're, we're all trying to wake up. You know, I, I, I got, and I'm not fully awake. I got, I may rip uh, one, 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 one eye patch off, but I still got another half to, to rip off before I see the whole, the, the, the whole program. You know, so everything, everything is about awakening. It's about, um, you know, choosing the red pill over the blue pill. You know, choosing the truth over fiction. Uh, uh, understanding that we're in this, uh, this system of the matrix, uh, literally, and um, uh, but that we can wake up from it when we choose to. You know, and the information is out there and the guidance is out there, uh, but we cannot sit on our butts and we cannot, we can no longer wait. We actually have to uh, take action and we have to take definitive action, intelligent action uh, that gets the results. So I always tell people, yeah, you have to collect the facts. Uh, you have to get the information. You organize that information into knowledge, which means you now understand how everything works. And then that knowledge has to be placed into wisdom. Wisdom is nothing more than that knowledge being used, placed into action in an intelligent way, getting the, the reaction that you are intending to have. And so that's what wisdom is. It's nothing more than utilizing knowledge consistently in the right way. And so this is where we all have to be knowledgeable, but then we have to have the wisdom of that knowledge, all right, what to do with the knowledge. And that's the, that's the critical point. So. Yes. And we want to thank you, everyone inside the chat room. Uh, very appreciative. Um, we had a, a slew of questions. We'll get to that in the next. We got more. We got more. And there's plenty. Uh, oh, plenty, yes. <laughs> plenty more. There's plenty more left. We just we're scratching the surface today. Uh, so, you know, and like I said, the email is there, the, the Facebook stuff is there for uh, Lennon. Uh, get the questions. I'll be, we'll, we'll start the next one with just answering the questions. Yeah, that's good. That's a good idea. Hey, we'll, maybe we'll, we'll spend the first 30 minutes or so just answering the, the questions from today's show. And, um, you know, with anybody that with any serious healing crisis, anything like that, feel free to e- email me and I'll, I'll get you on the right track or at least get, uh, uh, send you to where you can get the information. Uh, to get on the right track. Yes, so. and Dr. Z's email is totallifecentertlc at gmail.com, totallifecentertlc yeah. at gmail.com. It's also listed uh, below uh, with this complete bio uh, there. Dr. Z, it has been an absolutely phenomenal experience, and I'm so thankful that you have agreed to come on and share 
uh, this most important information. And, you know, to be quite honest with you, in all of my years of, of looking into information and studying and researching, I have yet to hear a doctor come out and speak about these topics as you there, have. There's no other doctor that will come out and say what I'm saying. Mm. <laughs> You know, that's uh, and that's the sad thing about it. I mean, I'm like, oh, I shouldn't be unique. I should be, this should be the, the, you know, the general thing. There should be many of us out here able to say this, you know, and that's why I'm like, well, that's probably why there's never been another, a, a doctor, a medical doctor, someone with uh, a degrees, uh, uh, the training in the sciences and the background that I have to ever come on the show because they, they what would they say? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we got we we get we getting it started though. We, we got to get it started at some point. We getting it started, yeah. and I'm like, yeah, this is just you know a part a, a, a part of my, my growing into my destiny. You going into your destiny. Listen, we're helping each other, right? And this is the way it should be. Everything should be team approach. We can't do it by ourselves. You got to have help. You got to have people that 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 are honest with integrity, that that you know you can trust to have your back, and they're out there. I ain't saying there's a whole lot of them out there, but they're out there, and those are the people that you put on your team, and uh, they, they they will help you, and that's how, and that's one of the you know one one of the keys to success is having a good a, a good trustworthy team, all right. And if they're not trustworthy, folks, if the relationships aren't good, if they're not trustworthy, get rid of them. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's you know because you, you're going to do yourself more damage than good. There's no, there's no reason, you know. Uh, uh, we'll talk about this next time a little bit. But most, most uh, when I look at uh, uh, male-female relationships, I mean, I look at, um, I look at both sides of the equation, and I'm like, most relationships fail because of how they got started. Mm-hmm. I mean, the connection on the lower levels, instead of the, instead of connections on the higher levels, and then on the uh, uh, romantic and um, sexual levels, if you start backwards, you're going to fail mm-hmm. every single time. Mm-hmm. Right? And I've been there many times and failed. <laughs> right? but, we, we, but you have to learn from your experiences. That's right. Like, okay, what am I doing wrong? What you're doing wrong is you're establishing the wrong connections at the wrong time. All right? So you cannot... And, and there's nothing more nurturing, all right, than connecting to Mother Nature, but nothing more nurturing than having, uh, for guys, having a, a positive woman that has your back that's 100% on your team and behind you, and you guys are connected consciousness to consciousness, heart to heart, first, mm. right? Uh, a friendship to friendship, and you're working together, all right? Therefore, your career doesn't have to come before her. It, you, she's always going to come before the career, right? Because she is you. That's right. Uh, and vice versa, right? So there's no conflict anymore, right? And so we have to learn that, and that takes that takes some that takes some doing and some experience, and uh, uh, but but we're learning. Everybody's learning. You're helping, by the way. Oh, thank you. And you're yeah. definitely helping too. You know, Scotty Pippen, Michael Jordan. We got to we got to building that team. <laughs> there you go. Count me in. <laughs> there we go. Uh, thank you so much. And and I'll be, we'll be in contact soon so we can uh, schedule the next interview for next month. And again, I want to thank you so much for bringing um, this information to the forefront. Again, I consider this to be a monumental show, and that I have yet to hear anyone address these topics. So I want to thank you so much for your candor and your courage. And I look forward to future lessons from you. Okay. I appreciate it. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity. And again, peace, power, prosperity to everybody. And most of all, love to everyone and and your families. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Z. You take care. All right. Okay, peace. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Trauma-based mind control, the making of medical doctors with Dr. Z. And there is so much more to cover. Some of the other topics that we will be getting into, uh, I'll just give you a quick list and then we'll close out the show here. Relationships. Um, drug addiction, and uh, especially within the medical uh, establishment, because that is a, a, is an issue uh, for medical doctors who are already doctors and also medical students, right? Drug addiction, uh, stress, and the stress levels uh, that the and Dr. Z, of course, talked about it, but we, we, I would like for him to expound on that a little bit more. And I, I, also financial pressure, we, he, he addressed that a bit as well, but we want to continue to uh, delve deeply into that issue. Um, traumatic events that occur in residency, et cetera, because doctors, they are exposed to uh, many horrific things. So I want, I want uh, Dr. Z to address that. Also racism, how, what was his experience in terms of racism? Does that play a role uh, in, it, has it played a role in his journey? Uh, pharmaceutical industry and its influence on the medical establishment. That's another topic uh, that I would like to have addressed. Uh, mental disorder amongst doctors. He had talked a little bit about that al- already. And then also nutrition for medical students, because he talked about sleep deprivation and light deprivation, et cetera. But, but what about nutrition um, or malnutrition uh, for medical students? Uh, that's another topic. So I'm going to send him a list of the, this list here, and then we will be sure in, the, in upcoming episodes to get to all of these as well. I want to also say that we had a um, 
someone who was in the chat room and she she was uh, uh, she had posted this. I won't say her name, but I just want to read this. And she said that my uncle was a medical doctor. He died in his car. He was homeless and he went crazy. Now I know why. And uh, seeing that and uh, having her write that, my friend that I made mention of uh, earlier, who uh, well, this was going back 10 years ago, she was about uh, $200,000 in debt. So I'm not sure where she's at now. But, um, you know, there was a part of me that I recognized that there was something that was not quite right about her psychologically. And I'm getting, I'm, I'm now, I now have a glimpse, and I'm all into human psychology, you know, and the manipulation of the, of the you know, conscious mind and the subconscious mind. I'm all into that. But now I kind of have an idea, at least an inkling. And with this inkling, I have a little bit more of an understanding as to why things go the way that they do, or they tend to go the way that they do when you're dealing with the medical establishment. And in this sense, we should also have compassion because doctors have been traumatized. And Dr. Z has outlined that already. He'll, he'll share more and, and expound on it even more. But even in this sense, just to get an understanding as to uh, even people that I have interacted with who were medical doctors and understanding levels of dysfunction that were clearly evident in them. Well, is it possible that it's all sourced from the trauma that they experienced in their process of becoming a medical doctor? So there's a whole lot to get into, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to thank everyone. Uh, this show, we went over an hour or two hours and 30 minutes. I want to thank everyone for, uh, for being patient through this process. We're going to pick back up with these topics. Also, the questions that people sent in. If you have any questions that you would like to have addressed in the next radio interview, you can send me an email at linen at linenhonor.com or on my Facebook page. You can just send me a message there. That's fine as well. Uh, real quickly here to close out, I want to thank everyone for tuning on. Everyone on the conference call, thank you for being here. Everyone inside the chat room, uh, it was Packed, uh, packed house uh, this evening. Everyone who listened in who were not was not in the uh, chat room, I want to thank you as well. And then those of you listening in the archive, I want to thank you as well for tuning in. I'm on Facebook under Linen Honor. I do have a YouTube account under Linen Honor Films. I will also be at the Free Your Mind Conference. I'm going to make mention uh, of that. Uh, you can get more information about that uh, www.freeyourmindconference.com www.freeyourmindconference.com uh, That conference is from the 25th through the 27th and I will be there and uh, for the whole time, but I will be doing my presentation on the 27th and my presentation will be the 911 fear-based mind control program which is uh, based upon my book the 911 fear-based mind control program i want to encourage you to get the book today you can go to linenhonor.com forward slash 911 the number is 911 linenhonor.com forward slash 911 it's available in paperback also as a direct download well, my name is Lennon Honor, and I manifest positivity to all of you who hear these words into the infinite creation streams and to all of existence, positivity, love, and happiness. Thank you so much for listening to this radio show here on LennonHonor.com, Trauma-Based Mind Control, The Making of Medical Doctors with Dr. Z, April 19th, 2013. Until next time, y'all please take care. Peace.